Our tale begins in the Hidden Rain Village, with the newly dubbed Sunin preparing to return home after their disastrous duel with Hanzo the Salamander. None of them are in particularly high spirits, as the dreary weather of this place reflects their moods, and when a trio of scruffy-looking war orphans approach them, the Konoha contingent's mood grows only darker, as they realise how many families have been torn apart by the Second Great Shinobi War. Orochimaru and his calculated pragmatism suggest that the kindest thing they can do for such wretches is to give them a quick and painless death. But Jiraiya, who is heartsick from all the killing they have had to do already, flatly refuses this idea, instead asking the children what they want. The seeming leader of the group, a boy with wild orange hair and a confidence unbecoming of his wretched state, says that he and his friends want to learn ninjutsu, so they can bring this awful war to an end. Tsunade, who has grown into quite the cynic since her lover Dan died, bluntly tells the children that just the three of them won't be able to make a difference, so they should give up this dream and go home. They'll live longer that way. However, the orange-haired boy passionately retorts that the three Sunin were able to make a difference, withstanding Hanzo's attacks when all their comrades died, so why can't they? Tsunade doesn't dignify such naivete with a response, while Orochimaru gives an amused little chuckle, as if watching a pet perform a novel trick. But Jiraiya gives the boy an honest smile, impressed by his guts. In a calm voice, the Toad Sage asks the boy for his name, and the names of his companions. A blue-haired girl with a sweet smile, and a pale red-headed boy with an overly long fringe that obscures his eyes. The orange-haired boy introduces himself as Yahiko, with the other boy being Nagato, and the girl being Conan. Jiraiya smiles at the three of them, saying that he too wants this war to end, so he will grant their request and train them personally. Orochimaru sneers that Jiraiya can't mean to stay in a desolate hellhole like this with these children, and Jiraiya grins that his old friend is right, he doesn't. If he's going to train these kids as shinobi, he wants them to have access to the best resources, and that means taking them back to Konoha. Tsunade calls this an idiotic idea, saying that Jiraiya can't just bring kids from an enemy nation into their village. What if they're spies? Chuckling a little, Jiraiya pushes Conan in front of him, asking if this cute face really looks like a spy to her. Unable to refute this, the slug princess merely fumes that when Jiraiya realises he's in over his head with this whole teaching thing, he better not come crawling to her for help, since she's a nurse, not a nurse maid. Jiraiya teases that this is pretty cold, looking to Orochimaru for backup, but aloof as ever, Orochimaru firmly states that he's not helping either, telling Tsunade that it's time to go, leaving Jiraiya to guide his three new charges back to the village on his own. When Jiraiya is alone with the kids, he sees that a tear is running down Nagato's cheek and asks him what's wrong. In a small voice, Nagato confesses that he doesn't want to go to Konoha. Yahiko chides him not to cry and whine since he's supposed to be a man, but Jiraiya tells the feisty boy to take it easy, kneeling down on the rain-soaked pavement so that he and Nagato can see eye to eye, or at least they could if that red mop wasn't in the way. In a soothing voice, Jiraiya asks Nagato why he doesn't want to go to Konoha, and the boy replies that Konoha Shinobi murdered his parents, who weren't even combatants. This hits Jiraiya like a kunai to the gut, and he gravely states that this war makes monsters of men. That is why he shares their dream of ending it. He then wipes the tear from Nagato's cheek, and as he does so, he lightly brushes away some of his hair to reveal... Those eyes, they look just like the ones the Sage of Six Parts was said to possess. Was this meeting predestined? Could this boy be the child of prophecy? Jiraiya doesn't know, though his gut tells him yes, and so brushing the hair behind Nagato's ears so their eyes can meet at last, the Toad Sage tells the child that he will not force him to go to Konoha, though long ago, he was given a prophecy that he would meet and guide a child who would save the world. He believes Nagato could be that child, though whether or not that is the case is entirely up to the boy. Yahiko claps his friend on the back, saying he always knew there was something special about him, while well, Konan emphatically congratulates Nagato, but Nagato himself remains stony-faced, asking why him? Weighing his options carefully, Jiraiya decides that honesty is probably the best way to handle the Child of Prophecy, and so he tells Nagato about the Rinnegan, and its fabled connection to the god of the shinobi world, Hagoromo Otsutsuki. This stuns little Nagato, who cannot imagine himself as any sort of god, but this shock is nothing compared to what Jiraiya tells him next. The legend has it the wielder of the Rinnegan is fated to either be a savior of the world, or its destroyer. For that reason, he implores Nagato to return to the village with him, so he can train him and guide him. A crease appears on Nagato's brow, and he says that he'll do it, if Jiraiya will make him a promise. 
Jiraiya asks what Nagato wants, and the boy tells him that he wants the Sunny to promise that he won't be used as another weapon in Konoha's war. His dream is to end war, not further it. Jiraiya promises that he will not allow Nagato to be used, and so man and boy shake hands, forming a compact which will have lasting ramifications for the entire world. Several days later, Jiraiya and the orphans arrive back in the Hidden Leaf Village, and for Nagato, Yahiko, and Konan, it is like they have gone to another world. This village is so sunny and peaceful, the people in the streets don't eye them with suspicion, instead smiling and waving to Jiraiya. There are no corpses lying in the open, nor burned out husks of buildings. In fact, even the buildings are weird, mostly one or two stories and made out of wood rather than metal. The group then head for the largest building in town, the Hokage Tower, where they are greeted by an old man behind a desk who Jiraiya introduces as Lord Third, his mentor, and the leader of the entire village. Nagato and Konan both bow to the Hokage, while Yahiko, bold as brass, sticks out a hand, saying it's nice to meet the old timer. Jiraiya snaps that Yahiko can't talk to Akage that way, but Hiruzen seems to find this amusing, and so rises to his feet to shake the boy's hand, asking to what he owes the pleasure of their visit. Jiraiya explains how he and the other Sunin found them in the aftermath of their battle with Hanzo, and requests permission to take them on as his own Genin squad. Hiruzen takes a deep pull on his pipe, clearly mulling this over, as he tells his former student that Orochimaru and Tsunade both told him about these children when they returned to the village, counselling him to reject Jiraiya's request, and return them where they came from. However, before he can continue, Jiraiya cuts in, telling Hiruzen that Orochimaru and Tsunade don't know the full story, then telling Nagato to show Lord Third his eyes. Obediently, Nagato pulls back his fringe and with a gasp, the old man asks if those are what he thinks they are. Jiraiya nods, stating his belief that Nagato is the reincarnation of the Sage of Six Paths, and the child of prophecy that the Great Toad Sage told him about. Hiruzen sighs that this makes things much more complicated, but Jiraiya disagrees, saying that it makes things much simpler, since it's his destiny to train the child of prophecy, so he has no choice but to be the boy's sensei. Hiruzen replies that there is a war going on, and he isn't sure if he can spare a shinobi as skilled as Jiraiya to have him try his hand at teaching right now. But Jiraiya, in a tone full of earnestness and more than a little ennui, tells his sensei that he's tired of war, tired of the killing, tired of the loss of friends and the worry of who will die tomorrow. He needs to train this boy because it's his fate, but more importantly, he needs to train this boy because he needs to know that he has brought a little light into the world for all the darkness he's created. The silence of the room hangs heavy for a moment. Then, with a deep sigh, Hiruza nods that Jiraiya has his blessing to train these children. The Toad Sage thanks his mentor, but in a gravely serious tone, Hiruzen warns Jiraiya that since he's asked for this, he expects his former pupil to dedicate himself entirely to training these children. He wants to see this trio grow not just as shinobi, but as members of the Hidden Leaf family, carrying the will of fire in their hearts. Jiraiya solemnly promises that he won't let the Hokage down, and with a smile, Hiruzen says that he better not, chuckling that if he catches him peeping on the hot springs where he's meant to be teaching, he'll tie him to a post like when he was a boy. This makes Yahiko and Konan giggle at their new sensei's expense, and in return Hiruzen gives them a grandfatherly smile, officially welcoming them to Konoha. The weeks that follow are challenging for Jiraiya to say the least, as he comes to realise that unlike a regular Genin squad, who have already undergone some basic training in ninjutsu and chakra control at the academy, his trio have no understanding at all of any shinobi arts, meaning he truly has to train them from the ground up. This, however, does give him a better understanding of the orphans' personalities. Yahiko is a firebrand, eager to try anything, but prone to running ahead and overestimating his own abilities and understanding of things. He is also brash and hard-headed, with a tendency to appoint himself the de facto leader of the group, at which point Jiraiya is forced to remind him that as their sensei, he is the actual leader. Konan, on the other hand, is more modest, also eager to learn, but with a methodical temperament that allows her to focus on mastering the task at hand before moving on to another. She also possesses the keenest intellect and strongest will of the group, leading Jiraiya to believe that Konan could grow up to be the most skilled Kunoichi of her generation. Then there is Nagato. What to say about him? 
He is quiet, modest, an excellent student with prodigious talent that allows him to learn everything Jiraiya teaches him, faster even than the Toad Sage can plan his next lesson. But there is also a fire to him, burning just below the surface which makes him fiercely protective of his teammates in Jiraiya. It also makes him determined to always push himself further and further, as if the weight of the entire world is riding on his back, which he supposes it is. And at times Jiraiya wonders if it was wrong of him to reveal to Nagato that he is the child of prophecy and put all that pressure on a ten-year-old. However, it's too late for such thoughts now, and Jiraiya is not one to go back on his decisions, so instead he does all he can to help Nagato carry that burden. At night when Conan and Yahiko have gone to sleep after long days of training, Nagato and Jiraiya dig through old books and scrolls that Hiruzen has provided them to get a better understanding of the Rinnegan. Though, as it is such a rare occurrence, there is precious little to be found, and with a war going on, it's not as if they can ask their neighbouring nations if they have any information on the Dojutsu. Nonetheless, Nagato remains undeterred, declaring that he will find a way to master his power and break the curse of war and hatred, thus bringing lasting peace. This makes Jiraiya prouder than he can say, and so he begins to channel this pride into a new story, one that he hopes can inspire others as Nagato has inspired him, the tale of the utterly gutsy shinobi. Finally, after three months, Jiraiya feels that his young charges are on par with Academy graduates, and so requisitions three-leaf forehead protectors for the kids. Summoning them to the training field bright and early the next day, he lays the headbands out and tells them they have earned the right to wear them as Shinobi of the Hidden Leaf. However, now they are officially Genin, he has a test for them, one that his sensei Lord Third had him and his teammates take part in. He then pulls out a pair of bells, saying that normally the function of the bell test is to have the new Genin try and take the bells from their sensei to ascertain their squad's teamwork abilities. But since this is not in question with them, it will instead be a test to see how much they have learned and grown during their time in the village. The newly minted Team Jiraiya nod, and so as one retreat into a nearby bush to plan their strategy. Moments later, Nagato emerges, running in a circle around Jiraiya, and begins to throw a mix of shuriken and kunai at his mentor. Jiraiya is easily able to deflect the ones that get close, but most of the weapons miss him by a wide margin, an oddity because Nagato's Rinnegan normally makes it all but impossible for him to miss a target, even at range. That tells Jiraiya that Nagato is missing on purpose, but why? Is it his natural aversion to hurting people taking hold? Jiraiya doubts this, since otherwise he would have tried something else with no risk of hitting him. But then he hears a set of heavy footfalls behind him, and it all becomes clear. Spinning around, he grabs a charging Yahiko by the shirt front, saying they should have swapped roles, since with his natural loudness, Yahiko would have been a better distraction for the quiet Nagato. But this only makes the orange-haired boy grin mischievously, and Jiraiya realises that he was the distraction. Looking down, he sees Conan coming in from his blind spot to try and seize the bell, having trusted both her friends to act as decoys, since Jiraiya wouldn't have expected a misdirect within another misdirection. Very clever, but unfortunately for them, not good enough, as before the girl can lay a hand on either bell, Jiraiya grabs her by the scruff of the neck and lifts her into the air. However, instead of looking disappointed, Conan congratulates her sensei on seeing through their trick, though she wonders if he saw through the other one. Jiraiya is confused for a moment, until he hears the sound of metal hitting metal. Craning his neck, he sees all the thrown weapons Nagato used bouncing off one another in a perfectly timed sequence that sends a single shuriken flying directly at his belt. Jiraiya tries to reach for his own pouch of projectiles, but with a child in each hand, this is impossible, and so to his horror, he is forced to watch as a shuriken severs the bell strings and sends them falling to earth. Dropping Yahiko, Jiraiya attempts to scoop the bells up before they can hit the ground, but Conan, using the fast hands only a life of thievery can provide, throws an origami flower at him. Seeing the inscription, Jiraiya realises this particular flower is made from an explosive tag, and so shouts as Conan makes the snake seal with her hand, causing the paper bomb to detonate, blowing them both back and allowing Yahiko to slide underneath and snatch the bells, claiming victory for the team. As Jiraiya gets to his feet, dusting off ash and grass stains, he is amazed that these children who mere months ago knew nothing of ninjutsu managed to get the bells on their first attempt. Even though he was holding back quite a bit, it is clear that he underestimated both their growth and more importantly their willingness to sacrifice themselves for each other. Truly they have the makings of spectacular shinobi. 
As Yahiko boasts that they're the greatest shinobi ever, a familiar voice tells the boy that while he and his team's efforts were impressive, they must not let it go to their heads. Hiruzen then steps out from behind a tree, telling Jiraiya that he's done an excellent job training these three, and that he should be very proud. Jiraiya smiles that he is, and asks his old sensei if he would like to join him in his new Genin squad for some celebratory ramen. Hiruzen politely declines, saying that as the Hokage, he simply does not have the time, but encourages them all to enjoy their day off, since as of tomorrow, they can expect to start receiving missions. Team Jiraiya choose the newly opened Ichiraku Ramen as the site of their celebration, where Yahiko immediately begins to regale anyone who will listen with the tale of how he and his friends outwitted Jiraiya of the legendary Sunny. Konan, despite having been there herself, and truthfully been more instrumental to the success of the plan than Yahiko, listens with rapt attention, while Jiraiya just good-naturedly laughs off his students' boasting as a way to let off steam after months of hard work. The only one who does not seem to be enjoying himself is Nagato, who sits silently, his jaw clenched in evident emotional turmoil. Comfortingly, Jiraiya asks the boy what is wrong, and without a word, Nagato raises his hand above the table to reveal the leaf forehead protector clutched in a white-knuckled grip. Jiraiya understands at once, but lets Nagato say it, figuring it will be just as much catharsis for the redhead as boasting is for Yahiko. Nagato sighs that he's proud of the progress he and his friends have made so far, and he's extremely grateful for all Jiraiya Sensei has done for them, but he doesn't know if he can wear this headband. This symbol is the last thing his parents saw before they died, and it feels like it would dishonor their memory to wear it. Jiraiya nods, saying he understands, but encourages Nagato to hold on to it anyway. He may not want to wear it, and Jiraiya certainly won't force him, but speaking as a man with a few more years under his belt, he knows that life has a way of making the unexpected into reality, and there may well come a day when Nagato needs that forehead protector, and should that day come, he would much rather his apprentice be looking at it than looking for it. Nagato nods placidly, and so tucks the headband inside his shirt, sighing that he will do as Jiraiya-sensei said, though he doubts he will ever choose to wear it. From there, the rest of the day is spent exploring the village, since the group has been too focused on their training to do anything fun like this before. Jiraiya is happy to show the kids a few of his favourite places, like a shop that sells amazing dango, which he buys for them all, and the hot springs, though when Conan asks him what it is he likes about this place, he just mumbles until she leaves him alone. The orphans also each try to find a place that speaks to them in the village, which pleases Jiraiya, as he truly does want this place to become their home. For Conan, it's an arts and crafts store which sells high quality origami paper. For Yahiko, it's the Hokage Rock, which he proudly declares will one day be emblazoned with his face as part of his plan to lead the world to a lasting peace. And for Nagato, it is... Jiraiya's apartment. The Toad Sage is a little disappointed that after all the fun places they visited, this is Nagato's choice, but then the boy explains why, saying that this is the first place he's felt safe since his parents died. The days and weeks that follow pass in the blink of an eye, with Team Jiraiya taking on a myriad of D-rank missions that keep them well within the walls of the village. With the war still raging outside, it is unwise to send untested Genin outside at this point, and after all the bloodshed he's seen, Jiraiya certainly isn't complaining using his time to find lost cats and help old ladies carry their groceries home. It also gives him more time to train Nagato, Yahiko, and Konan in actual ninjutsu now that they've proved themselves capable of the basics. Konan quickly develops her own unique fighting style, using pieces of origami paper laced with chakra in place of shuriken and kunai, though she believes that with time she will be able to expand upon this into something truly incredible. Yahiko, on the other hand, focuses his attention on learning all of Jiraiya's jutsu, having decided that emulating him is the path to power. The Toad Sage wonders if perhaps Yahiko could one day undergo sage training in Mount Miyaboku, though first the passionate young man would have to master being still, a prospect so unlikely that only Tsunade would bet on it. As for Nagato, his Rinnegan grants him access to all five of the basic chakra natures right off the bat, as well as the ability to learn anything Jiraiya can throw at him. In that regard, he is both a teacher's dream and nightmare, as Jiraiya never has to waste time repeating anything, but also must constantly be on the lookout for new things to feed this boy's curiosity. As a result, Nagato is often assigned to independent study on the Rinnegan, so that Jiraiya can focus on Konan and Yahiko, ensuring that they keep up. 
Eventually, however, this relative peace is forced to come to an end, as one evening Hiruzen calls Jiraiya into his office to meet with the village elders, Koharu, Hamura, and Danzo. Jiraiya pays his respects to the elders, asking what the purpose of this meeting is, and in his usual unctuous voice, Danzo tells Jiraiya that it's time for him and his team to carry out their first mission outside the village. The way the man says it makes it sound like praise, as if commending them for all their hard work, but Jiraiya isn't convinced, and so asks if this is safe, what with the war and the kids only being newly minted genin. Seeing that affability isn't working, Danzo switches to firmness, telling the Toad Sage that the Council have discussed it, and in order to continue harboring Nagato, they need proof of his value, and a more practical test of his Rinnegan abilities than just a bell test. Jiraiya gives Hiruzen a reproachful look for telling the rest of the Council about Nagato's Rinnegan, but Danzo smirks that Jiraiya shouldn't worry, since if Nagato really is this child of prophecy, then he'll surely survive this mission without issue. After all, he has hasn't fulfilled his legendary destiny yet. This last part is said with an unmistakable sneer, but Jiraiya pays the man's belief or lack thereof in prophecy no mind, instead asking what about Conan and Yahiko, who are still only new to the ninja world. In return, Danzo asks, what about them? His tone making it very clear that in his mind, they're expendable in the name of this test. He then adds that if Jiraiya is unwilling to undertake this mission, the orphans can always be reassigned to a more cooperative journey later. Growling that he guesses his hands are tied, Jiraiya agrees, and so after receiving the details, departs to inform his team of tomorrow's mission. Thankfully, due to Hiruzen's influence, the mission is a relatively tame one, even for a C rank, simply delivering medical supplies to one of their camps on the border of the Land of Fire and Land of Rivers. However, there is still the chance to run into enemy shinobi, and so Jiraiya prioritizes caution over speed in this case, having his team take a circuitous route to the camp that keeps them well within their own territory for the majority of the trip. This caution pays off, as they reach the camp without issue, and are able to make their delivery within the allotted time frame. The Leaf Shinobi are grateful for these supplies, and so their leader, Sakumo Hadake, offers the team to stay the night with them, promising that his men have some great war stories, and can even make a halfway decent dinner with the rations they've been given. Under normal circumstances, Jiraiya would accept, having a love for stories, and being eager for a chance to get to know some of the female Shinobi better. But even without looking, he can feel something almost like killing intent radiating off Nagato at the sight of so many green flak jackets and leaf headbands all in one place. And so putting his students' needs above his own desires, he declines, saying that he'd rather have his Genin team back behind the walls of Konoha as soon as possible. Sakamo understands, and so wishes them a swift journey home, asking that if they happen to run into a certain young woman from the Inazuka clan, to let her know that he's still alive, and he misses her. Jiraiya promises to pass on the message, and so he and his team depart. Night has fallen by now, unfortunately, which Jiraiya recognizes as a double-edged sword. It will make them harder to track, but also mask the approach of any enemies who might be following them. As a result, he opts for speed this time, taking the most direct route back to the village, and having them leap from tree to tree as fast as they can. Nagato, Yahiko, and Konan all push themselves to match pace with their sensei, with the boys knowing that something has Jiraiya worried, while the more perceptive Konan has a pretty good idea of what's on his mind, and so takes the rearguard position to protect her friends if anything comes at them from behind. However, the trap is not sprung from behind, but rather from dead ahead. On a moonless night such as this, Jiraiya doesn't spot the ninja wire trap until Nagato calls out for him to watch out. This allows him to evade the worst of it, but he is still pretty badly cut up when his speeding body collides with taut wire. Then to make matters worse, the wires snap, sending a barrage of kunai and shurikens flying from all directions at him. Using his fireball jutsu, Jiraiya is able to melt or dispel most of these attacks, but the same cannot be said for the tanto blade that is driven into his back moments later. Gasping in pain, Jiraiya turns to see a hidden sand Anbu holding the sword, before five more of his contemporaries descend from the foliage above and attempt to similarly skewer the Sarnin. Jiraiya is thankfully able to block the death blow with his Wild Lion's main technique, using his hair as a shield, but even so, six against one are not good odds. 
Yahiko yells for his friends to follow him and help Jiraiya Sensei, but Jiraiya bellows at them to stop, ordering them to run and to get back to the village as fast as they can. Furiously, Yahiko shrieks that they can't just leave him, but Jiraiya resolutely orders them to do as he says, while smacking two of the Anbu's heads together. To his credit, the Toad Sage is holding his own pretty well, but even still, the Genin feel a lump form in their stomachs as they carry out their orders and flee. Unfortunately, it seems that these Sand Shinobi are under orders to leave no witnesses, and so one of their number breaks off from the fight with Jiraiya to tail the kids. Moving at incredible speeds, she quickly gets ahead of the trio, using her own Tanto to slice the branch they are standing on right out from under them, sending them crashing onto the forest floor below. The kids crumple in a heap, and before they can act, the Anbu is on top of them. Reaching down, she grabs Nagato, casting him aside so that his back slams into a tree, winding him. Conan calls out her friend's name in concern, while Yahiko barks at the woman to leave Nagato alone. However, the Sand Shinobi takes this advice a little too literally, it would seem, as she promptly turns back to Konan and Yahiko, pulling a large fan from her back and whipping up a gust of wind which she quickly turns into blades which slice at the pair, drawing blood and forcing them to slump against the tree. The sadistic Sand Nin then readies a handful of lightning chakra to finish them off, but before she can deal the killing blow, Nagato rises to his feet and runs in, putting his own body between the attack and his friends. As he does, his hair parts to reveal his Rinnegan, and to the shock and horror of the assailant, a barely visible bubble begins to form around the boy and his friends, drinking in the lightning chakra before it can do any harm. Stumbling back, the Anbu gasps that this is impossible, but Nagato does not seem to hear her, instead simply glowering at her with his exposed eye. In a low, cold voice, he tells her to leave and return to her village, since while he does not want to hurt her, he will not allow this war to take anyone else who is precious to him. Under the pressure of the Rinnegan's glare, the Anbu complies, using the body flicker technique to vanish, and moments later, Jiraiya appears in the clearing, indicating that the other Anbu did likewise. Concern in his face, the Toad Sage asks if everyone is alright, and the Geni nod, before Yahiko asks how hidden Sand Shinobi were able to attack this close to the village. Gravely, Jiraiya replies that they weren't hidden sand. They may have dressed like them, but the Tanto they used were unmistakably the ones used by Konoha Anbu. They probably used them since they weren't comfortable fighting with weapons from the hidden sand, and they were confident there would be no survivors to report on this fault in their deception. Nonplussed, Yahiko asks what that means, but this time it is Konan who answers. In a voice full of worry, she tells her friends that this means their true enemy isn't outside the village. It's within. It is almost midnight by the time Team Jiraiya arrive back in the village, having resumed their more slowed pace after the attempted assassination by their unknown enemy. The mood is heavy as they retire to Jiraiya's apartment, daring not even to speak in the open for fear of who could be listening in. As soon as they are sure they are safe, Yahiko asks if Jiraiya Sensei is certain the people who attack them are from within the village. Gravely, Jiraiya nods, saying that it's his business to focus on small details that others wouldn't notice, since that's how he can plot causality. And for that reason, he is certain that the Tanto those ninja used were definitely from Konoha. Yahiko flops down with a sigh, saying that still doesn't help them much, since how are they meant to find their enemy with so many people in the village who it could be? Here Conan smiles, telling him to cheer up since the pool of people who might be trying to kill them is actually much smaller than the whole village. Yahiko sarcastically says he's so glad to hear it. But Conan keeps smiling, saying that the attack was an ambush, meaning that whoever's behind it had to know they would be outside the village tonight, as well as a rough idea of where they were going. Jiraiya praises this deductive reasoning, saying that narrows down the suspect significantly. He then lists out the possibilities, saying it had to either be the Hokage, one of the village elders, or one of the shinobi they met at the military encampment. Yaiko looking to help suggests that it could have been the gate guards, but Jiraiya tells him that it couldn't for two reasons. First, the gate guards only know who is leaving and when, not where they are going or the details of their mission. And second, whoever is behind this needs to have the influence to attract five or six co-conspirators, since from battling them, Jiraiya can confirm that their attackers were all real people rather than clones. Yahiko looks saddened by this dismissal, but Jiraiya grins that he likes to see Yahiko using his head and thanks him for contributing. He then asks Nagato if he has any insight to share, and upon hearing his name, the boy jerks up as if coming out of deep thought. Humbly, he apologizes for not really having anything to contribute before resuming his contemplation. 
Jiraiya then adds there is one other thing they must figure out to get to the bottom of this assassination attempt, the identity of the target. The kids ask what he means, and Jiraiya explains that while it's probable the enemy would have killed them all if given the chance, that is unlikely to be their true objective. More likely than not, one of them is the enemy's true target, and if they can figure out who, then they can probably figure out why, and that will give them a pretty good idea who the mastermind behind this conspiracy really is. Conan asks if Jiraiya Sensei has any suspicions about who the mastermind is, and Jiraiya admits there are a few names he thinks are more likely, as well as a few he thinks are less likely to be the one, but he's trying not to think about that right now, since he doesn't want to bias himself, otherwise his investigation might be corrupted trying to fit evidence into his own narrative, rather than seeing it for what it really is. Yaiko asks if that means he'll even be treating his own sensei, old man Hiruzen, as a suspect, and with a sad smile, Jiraiya nods, saying at this point no one is above suspicion. Conan asks what he'll do if Lord Third is revealed to be the culprit, and Jiraiya through a forced smile tells her not to worry. He gave his word that he'd protect and guide the three of them, and he's not the kind of man who goes back on his promise, even if that means he has to kill his own sensei to fulfil it. The conversation dies after this declaration, the weight of what Jiraiya has said hanging over all of them just as heavily as the attack. After such a long day, Yaiko and Conan head off to bed soon after, falling asleep before their heads even touch the futons. But Nagato remains where he is, still lost in that deep thought. Approaching him, Jiraiya asks what's on Nagato's mind, and the boy explains everything that happened after they split up, before finishing with the way he somehow managed to absorb the lightning jutsu. Jiraiya nods, saying that he's not surprised Nagato did that, since chakra absorption was one of the Sage of Six Paths famed Six Paths jutsu. Nagato asks why Jiraiya Sensei never mentioned these before, and the Toad Sage laughingly admits that he wasn't sure if they were tied to the Rinnegan or not, and didn't want to put additional pressure on Nagato in case he couldn't perform the Jutsu. Nagato nods his understanding, but says that now that it seems they have their confirmation, he wants to study these Six Path Jutsu, as well as figure out how to manifest Jutsu absorption at will, since he needs to be able to protect Yahiko and Konan like he did tonight. Jiraiya promises that he will help Nagato in any way he can, but for now it's late, and as his sensei, he thinks it's best if he gets some sleep, since they have another long day ahead of them tomorrow. The next morning, Team Jiraiya report to the Hokage's office to give their report on their mission to Hiruzen and the Elders. As per Jiraiya's instruction, no one mentions the assassination attempt, waiting to see if anyone slips up and reveals something they shouldn't. Unfortunately, nothing is ever that easy, and so they are dismissed with congratulations of a job well done by Hiruzen. From here their schedule returns to normal, a mix of D-rank missions and training. Though Yahiko still wishes to emulate his sensei, he also picks up a new field of training, sword fighting, specifically training with the sort of tanto their enemy used against them. After needing to be saved by Nagato in the forest, and Conan figuring out the true meaning behind the attack while he kept making mistakes, he is starting to feel useless, especially since he's supposed to be their leader, and so he endeavours to truly master this type of weapon, so that if someone tries to attack his friends again, he'll be able to protect them. Konan continues to hone her paper ninjutsu in the methodical manner for which she is known, while Nagato shifts his study from the Rinnegan specifically to the Sage of Six Paths, learning about his famed Six Path Jutsu. He quickly becomes familiar with each of these techniques, those being the Deva Path, which grants access to attractive and repelling forces, the Asura Path, which allows the user to augment their body, the Human Path, which allows the user to read minds at the cost of the target's life, the Animal Path, which grants access to a number of summoning creatures, the Preda Path, which he has already used to absorb Jutsu, and the Naraka Path, which allows the user to manifest the King of Hell. However, in spite of all this study, he is no closer to drawing out the Preda Path or any other path on command. On top of all of this, Team Jiraiya also continues their investigation into their unknown assailant. Alas, with no real leads beyond their short list of potential suspects, all of whom are either outside their reach, or occupy such positions of power in the village they cannot question them, there is precious little they can turn up. Fortunately, a prime opportunity to get a few answers lands squarely in Jiraiya's lap a few weeks after their return. Hiruzen once more calls the Toad Sage into his office, saying that he has another C-rank mission that will require the team to leave the village. Jiraiya asks what it is, and Hiruzen tells him it's to inspect an abandoned hidden sand base for any tactical or otherwise valuable information they might have left behind. Jiraiya asks why his team have been selected for such a mission, and the Hokage explains that it was at the request of Sakamo Hadake, since with his platoon being redeployed to the front line, he needs a small group of shinobi to assist him, and he liked the way Jiraiya and his team conducted themselves. 
Resisting the urge to add a suspicious edge to his voice, Dreyer asks if that's so, laughing that he guesses he must be training his Genin right if they've caught the attention of the White Fang. The gutsy Sanin then adds his next line of questioning, asking if two Jonin are really needed for a C-rank mission, especially one to an abandoned facility. Hiruzen admits that they aren't, but says that he would have thought Jiraiya would want to accompany his Genin squad as a chaperone. Jiraiya laughs that he trusts them to be able to handle themselves for a few days, especially if they have Sakamo watching over them. Plus, it'll give him a chance to finish the current chapter he's working on for his book. Hiruzen shrugs that if that's what Jiraiya wants, he'll take him off the mission. Jiraiya thanks his mentor, then heads off to inform his squad of the plan. Naturally, the three Genin are all shocked at the idea of going on a mission without their sensei, particularly one where their temporary commander will be one of the people they suspect of trying to kill them. However, Jiraiya grins that this is the genius of the plan. By seemingly making themselves vulnerable to Sakamo, they'll be able to determine his guilt or innocence. Not only that, but since he's staying here, if someone attacks him, then he'll know that he's the target rather than the kids. Nagato and Yahiko nod their understanding of this plan, while Conan asks her since it a backtrack to his comment about seemingly making themselves vulnerable. Jiraiya calls this a clever pickup before handing her a scroll. He then explains that he's sealed a shadow clan of himself inside the scroll. If Sakuma or anyone else attacks them, all they need to do is break the seal on the scroll and the clone will protect them. Nagato, who has come across shadow clones in his reading, asks if the doppelganger only having half of Jiraiya's sensei's power will be an issue. But rather immodestly, Jiraiya retorts that half of his strength is more than enough to deal with pretty much any enemy they may encounter, even the legendary White Fang. Also, if the need arises for them to pass on a message, they can just bring out the clone, tell it what they have to, then hit it on the head with Yahiko's sword, which will transmit the message back to him in an instant. Now knowing that they do have contingency plans, the mood relaxes a bit, and so to celebrate their first mission without him, Jiraiya offers to buy the kids some ramen before they ship out. The next morning, Team Jiraiya depart the village gate, Unfortunately, it would be too suspicious if they travelled any slower than necessary, potentially tipping off their enemy to the fact that they have an idea on their identity, and so they leap from tree to tree at top speed, arriving at Sakamo's new encampment by midday. The two men then shake hands, with Jiraiya formally handing over command of his team to Sakamo, and wishing his squad good luck on their mission. They all thank him, and moments later Jiraiya vanishes with the body flicker technique. The now team Sakamo then set off for their own destination, and there is a tenseness to the group from the moment Jiraiya leaves. However, Sakamo puts this down to the three Genin being nervous about their first mission without their sensei, and so tries to lighten their mood by having them spend the night in an inn, rather than forcing them to camp out on the cold ground. As they all gather in the dining room, one of the waitresses approaches Sakamo, asking if he's the fabled White Fang of Konoha. Sakamo smiles that he is, and the woman says that his meal is on the house. Chuckling, Sakamo muses that he guesses there are some upsides to this war, since he never would have been offered a free dinner before. Konan immediately looks to Nagato, knowing how much will upset him to hear someone speak flippantly about the war, and though killing intent is radiating off of him, it is Yahiko who pipes up. In a scornful voice, he asks if Sakamo thinks the girl gave him that because she likes him, or because she's impressed by his title. She didn't. She gave it to him because she's scared of him. She's scared that unless she gives him whatever he wants, he and his buddies from the Hidden Leaf will kill her family, steal anything of value from her homeland, then ravage the rest for fun. Just like they did in the Hidden Rain to him and his family. Sakamo is taken aback by this, admitting that he didn't know, but Yahiko snaps that's because he didn't care enough to know. For those blessed to be from the five major nations, war is just a game to see how much they can expand their territory and influence, to win some new titles, and bang their chest if a rival is getting a bit uppity, but nothing to fear, since even if they lose this particular war, they'll win back anything they lost in the next one. But for those in the smaller villages, it's not a game, it's a nightmare, in which they're powerless to do more than watch as everyone and everything they hold dear is devoured in the name of the bigger village's greed. Sakamo is left in stunned silence by this vitriolic rebuke, so Yahiko goes on, declaring that war is a cruel, stupid, and worthless thing, and those who see it as anything else are just as cruel, stupid, and worthless. And with that, he rises to his feet and storms out of the room, not even touching a mouthful of food, despite the hunger he must be feeling. Yaiko doesn't speak for the rest of the night, or even into the next day, anger at Sakamo radiating off him like heat. Sakamo attempts to apologize, but when met by Yaiko's contemptuous glare, acknowledges that the boy's feelings are justified, hoping they can at least work together long enough to complete the mission. 
Conan and Nagato are similarly angry, but mask it better, with Conan focusing instead on watching Sakamo for any signs of duplicity, while Nagato uses his Rinnegan to look out for enemies or traps. Eventually they do make it to the Hidden Sand Base, a two-story tower made out of sandstone, which lives up to its reputation of being abandoned. Team Sakamo make their way inside, with Conan and Sakamo heading to one end of the base to catalog any intel they can find, while Yahiko and Nagato start on the other end. Now that he is out of sight, Yahiko fumes about Sakamo, calling him a typical warmonger, which Nagato finds himself easily agreeing with. He then offers Yahiko one of his food pills, saying that his friend must be starving and exhausted after travelling two days with only Jiraiya Sensei's ramen for energy. Yahiko gratefully accepts, though he does grumble that these somehow taste worse than the spoiled food they would steal from the garbage back home. Nagato chuckles a little that he's right, saying that at least Konoha usually has good food and lots of it. Yahiko agrees, and so the pair set to work. Since the sand shinobi left in quite a hurry, there are plenty of valuable documents to be found, and Nagato and Yahiko gather as many as they can carry. When they meet up with Konan and Sakamo at the base of the stairwell leading to the next level, the White Fang praises the boys for their diligence. He then suggests that they switch teams for this next floor, opting to go with Yahiko, presumably hoping to speak with the boy alone. Yahiko responds with a jerky nod, and the group proceed up the stairs. Turning a corner, the group are given a small fright when they see what they think is a man seated on the bottom step. However, upon closer inspection, they quickly discover that the man is in fact some sort of automaton or puppet. Conan finds this utterly fascinating, having heard from Jiraiya Sensei that the Hidden Sand use puppet soldiers, and so goes in for a closer look. However, Nagato tells her to stop when his Rinnegan allows him to see minute chakra threads suddenly dart into view, connecting with the puppet's back. The puppet then rises to its feet, and with a cacophonous clang, lunges at Conan. Sakamo orders the team to fall back, but Yaiko is done taking orders from this guy, and so Tanto raised, leaps in, blocking the puppet's thrust with his blade and protecting Conan. Unfortunately, the puppet has more than simple strikes up its sleeve, as his chest cavity suddenly bursts open, allowing a pair of pincers to shoot out, clamping around Yaiko's arms and torso, pulling him inside. Conan and Nagato cry out for their friend, but are silenced when a man with red hair a shade lighter than Nagato's, and a woman with long brown hair emerge from out of view. The chakra threads are connected to the man's hands, making him the puppeteer, while the woman has a demon wind shuriken raised to cover her partner. Both wear the attire and headband of the hidden sand, and in spite of himself, Nagato's first thought is that this is confirmation of Sakamo being their enemy, leading them into this trap and using the same deception as last time. But this fades as he realises that neither of them are carrying Tanto blades, and unlike last time, this is a place where Hidden Sand Shinobi could plausibly be. This anger is replaced by a rush of shame at how easily he gave into his biases, and so the redhead turns his attention back to saving Yahiko. Thankfully Conan at least is level-headed, and so she wastes no time with mental accusations, instead pulling out Jiraiya's scroll. She then prepares to open it, but is stopped when with a twitch of the puppeteer's finger, the metal monstrosity belches a torrent of flame which incinerates the scroll, cutting off their only lifeline. The woman then barks at them that if they try anything like that again, they'll snap this kid like a twig. To prove her point, the puppeteer has his puppet's pincers tighten around Yahiko, making the boy grit his teeth in pain. The man then calls the puppet back to him, telling the Konoha contingent to turn over any documents they have found and surrender, or Yahiko dies. Knowing that the policy of the major shinobi nations is to sacrifice a comrade if it means the success of the mission, Nagato is already ready for an argument when he tells Sakamo they have to do what the sand shinobi say. However, to everyone's surprise, the white-haired man agrees, telling Nagato and Konan to give him all the documents they've gathered. Still suspicious, Nagato asks why Sakamo is doing this, and Sakamo smilingly replies that Yahiko is his comrade, and he'll never turn his back on a comrade. That's his ninja way. Something like respect for the man blossoms in Nagato's chest at this, and so he does as he's told, handing Sakamo the documents. The White Fang then tells the San Shinobi to let Yahiko go and take him instead, saying that a Jonin is far more valuable than a Genin, so he'll make better insurance. Nodding, the man slowly has his puppet drift closer to Sakamo, the tension of the situation etched on his face. Sakamo in turn steps forward, one hand outstretched with the papers they've collected, and the other raised in a gesture of surrender. Outside, a slight desert wind kicks up, sending a faint gust through the room. 
This unbalances the papers, and so on instinct, Sakuma reaches out with his free hand to catch them. Nagato with his enhanced eyesight is able to see all of this, but the San Shinobi do not. All they see is their enemy making a sudden movement, and so they respond in kind, with the man flicking the finger controlling the pincers down sharply. Nagato screams, knowing the horrific sight that will come next, but in doing so prevents it. All around him, some divine force pushes everything backwards, causing even the tower to crumble. Looking up, Nagato sees the puppet and fragments on the floor, with Yahiko lying beside it, injured but alive. Conan and Sakumo lie behind him, seemingly uninjured, but the same cannot be said for the sand duo. The man is clearly dead, his head caved in by a chunk of falling sandstone, and the woman is not far off, the shuriken she had raised against them now embedded in her own chest. Tears fill Nagato's eyes. He didn't mean to do this. He never wanted to hurt anyone. He just wanted his friend to be safe. Then, as if his heart was not broken enough, the woman pulls a locket out from under her top and stares lovingly into the picture as the last light leaves her eyes. Stumbling over, Nagato inspects the image. It is of the man and woman he just killed standing together, smiling down at a boy with her eyes and his hair. Through a voice strangled with tears, Nagato cries that he's sorry, but in his heart he knows that this is just as worthless as the apologies of the men who took his parents from him. No one says anything as they gather around Nagato, laying their hands on the boy's shoulder. Finally, when Nagato believes he has no more tears left to cry, he wordlessly begins collecting the documents scattered in the blast. This silence from Nagato persists for the entire journey home, with the only exception being the grunts he gives when asked a direct question by Sakamo. All three of his comrades do their best to cheer him up, with Yahiko even seemingly mended fences with Sakamo in the wake of his declaration at the tower. However, Nagato cannot get that boy off his mind, the one he orphaned, the one who will now be forced to know his pain. When they arrive back at the village gates, Sakamo tells Nagato that he doesn't have to come with them to the Hokage's office if he doesn't want to, encouraging him to take the night off and rest. Nagato nods, and as the others depart, he turns back and begins to walk out of the village. At first, his pace is a stumbling walk, but it quickly becomes more sure-footed, picking up speed with each new horrific thought that enters his mind. The life that child will have, the look on his mother's face when she died, the day he lost his own parents, and the inescapable truth that he has become a part of this war whether he wants to be or not. By now, he is sprinting, leaping from tree to tree, as if he can somehow outrun his guilt and shame. He does not know where he is going, but that doesn't matter. Nothing matters except his refusal to be another tool in the cycle of war and hatred. From behind him, Nagato hears the calm voice of Jiraiya Sensei muse that he didn't take Nagato for a runner, since he figured he'd be smart enough to know that running from problems doesn't fix anything. And when the boy looks back, he sees the sun in hot on his trail. Nagato asks if Jiraiya has come to take him back to the village, but the older man shakes his head, saying he's just come to talk. He then body flickers ahead, grabbing Nagato, and before the redhead can stop him, seating him beside him on a tree branch. In a sympathetic voice, the Toad Sage then sighs that Conan told him what happened during the mission. Nagato is at a loss for words, and without anything to distract him, tears once more begin to flood his face. Exhaling deeply, Jiraiya says nothing, simply putting an arm around the boy's shoulder and allowing him to weep into his own. Finally, when Nagato is all cried out, Jiraiya tells his student that what happened wasn't his fault. It was a tragic accident, but Nagato shakes his head, saying that isn't true. It wasn't really an accident, since in that moment, when Yahiko's life was at stake, he didn't see the San Shinobi as people, he just saw them as a threat that had to be removed. And he hated them for it. Jiraiya nods gravely, saying this is all part of growing up, coming to understand feelings like hate and pain, since only by understanding them can one reflect on them and come up with their own answers about how to respond. Nagato breathes that he doesn't have any answers. All he knows is that he doesn't want to inflict that sort of pain on anyone else ever again. With a hint of his usual chuckle, Jiraiya asks if he really thought running away wouldn't cause more pain. Sure, he wouldn't have to cause it by fighting anymore, but what about the pain Conan and Yaiko would feel at being abandoned? That Jiraiya would feel at losing someone he's come to care deeply about? A few more tears leak out of Nagato's eyes as he says he doesn't know. It feels like no matter what he does, it will cause someone to suffer. He then pleadingly asks his sensei if he has any answers, because at this point, he'll do anything. 
With a sad sigh, Dre admits that he doesn't have an answer, though what he believes is that one day people will be able to live in peace and understanding with one another, but only if those who believe in that future are willing to work for it, to fight for it if they have to. Nothing great ever comes without cost, but that is why shinobi exist, to bear those burdens so that others can live freely. Nagato asks what about those who are lost along the way, and looking him squarely in the eye, not as his master, but as another person who knows the guilt the boy is feeling, Jiraiya tells Nagato that all they can do is make sure those deaths are not in vain, by never giving up on the dream of peace, since that is the only way in which their sacrifice means anything. Nagato nods that he thinks he understands, and so rising to his feet, follows Jiraiya back to the Leaf Village. He cannot change the past, but he will honour the people whose lives he took by ensuring that the child in the picture will know a world of peace. This is his vow as a shinobi. Three months have passed since Team Jiraiya's mission to the Land of Wind, and no further incidents have arisen to test our heroes. However, this is not to say that they're at peace. Nagato still wakes each night in a cold sweat, the faces of the two sand shinobi and their child still haunting his dreams. And more than once he has woken to see his friends, or Jiraiya sensei standing over him, telling him that he's been screaming in his sleep. Unfortunately, there is little any of them can do about this, and so focusing on what they can control, they continue their training as per usual. Though the three Genin have grown more proficient in their general ninja arts, none of them have had any significant breakthroughs in their areas of specialization. With Konan still unable to perfect this latest technique she's devised for her paper ninjutsu, Yahiko still unable to master the Tanto Blade, and Nagato still unable to activate any of the Rinnegan's powers outside of a life or death situation. Even Jiraiya Sensei is in something of a rut, as his investigation into their enemy has turned up nothing new, even if he is fairly sure he knows who they are, with no evidence he cannot act, and so must wait for them to strike again, a prospect he does not relish. However, the Toad Sage at least has given some slight balm for his worries, when he is informed that Orochimaru and Sanade have finally returned to the village. Gathering his squad, Jiraiya goes to meet his two friends at the gate, welcoming them home. Both Orochimaru and Tsunade look surprised to see the children with Jiraiya, with Tsunade commenting that Hiruzen always was too lenient with him, while Orochimaru is more intrigued by Nagato's eyes now that he can see them. There is a hunger to the snake Sanin's gaze as he inspects Nagato, so much so that Yaiko steps between them, a scowl on his face, and one hand firmly planted on the hilt of his tanto. Trying to defuse the tension, Jiraiya tells his student to take it easy, saying they're all friends here, but Yahiko doesn't take his eyes off Orochimaru for an instant, reminding his sensei that when they first met, Orochimaru wanted to kill him, Nagato, and Konan. Orochimaru coos that he suggested it. If he had wanted to kill them, they'd be dead. He then flicks his yellow eyes up to Jiraiya, using that students really do take after their masters, since this one is as ill-mannered as him. Jiraiya chuckles that Orochimaru's got him there, agreeing Yahiko is quite similar to him, a claim which makes the Genin beam with pride, showing that even his smile resembles his masters. Jiraiya then continues that in fact all three of his students remind him a lot of how they were as kids, since Nagato is a genius like Orochimaru, and Konan's got a lot of willpower just like Tsunade, not to mention when she's older should be quite the looker. He then flashes Tsunade his best pervy grin, but the woman rebuffs it with a scoff that says not if you were the last man on earth, before sauntering off to report to Hiruzen. Orochimaru follows suit, though before he goes, he tells Jirai that he should be pleased. His students are most intriguing. This sends a shiver down Yahiko's spine, and when the Pale Man is gone, he tells Jiraiya that he still doesn't like him. Jiraiya replies that Orochimaru has his quirks, and even a few unsavory qualities, but he's fought alongside him enough times that he trusts the other man like a brother. Yahiko grumbles in that case he guesses he can give him a chance, though something still seems off about the guy. That evening, after the kids have gone to bed, Jiraiya seeks out his fellow Sanin, hoping that he finally has someone else to confide in. Over a few drinks, he admits that since he started teaching, he's never been so afraid and so happy at the same time. Afraid that he's going to let his students down, but happy at being able to witness each of their successes, and in a way just being with them. Orochimaru, who as usual remains perfectly sober, tells his comrade that he is falling victim to his own sentimentality, and these children are truthful 
successfully little more than a diversion he could do without. However, Tsunade, who is a few drinks in herself, actually comes to Jiraiya's defense, saying she thinks he's growing up at long last and learning to care about something other than his lurid and lecherous pursuits. Jiraiya laughs that if he didn't know better, he'd say she actually sounds impressed by him, suggesting that he'd be happy to show her how grown up he is over a date. This is met as one would expect, with a fierce uppercut from the Taijutsu mistress which sends Jiraiya flying, while Orochimaru muses that neither of them have changed all that much from when they were Genin. Turning in unison, Jiraiya and Tsunade protest that that isn't true at all, with Jiraiya using this brief interlude to retake his place at the table without getting hit again. He then lowers his voice and says that he didn't just call them here to gush about his students. He actually wanted to ask what either of them know about Dunzo Shimura. Orochimaru says that he knows little beyond the man's reputation for his fervent, even brutal patriotism, while Tsunade says that Great Uncle Toby Rama actually did mention Dunzo to her once or twice when she was little. Jiraiya eagerly asks what Lord Second had to say about him, and Tsunade replies that Toby Rama always thought he had the same sort of ambition as Madara Uchi. When channeled into the right cause, it could reshape the world and turn the stuff of dreams into reality. But if his aim ever turned to darkness, no one would be safe from him, and only death would keep him from his goals. Orochimaru chuckles that he sounds quite formidable, before asking why Jiraiya is suddenly interested in the man, to which the Toad Sage replies, because I think he's trying to kill me and my students. This declaration startles Tsunade, who spills her drink, before questioning if Jiraiya is sure, breathing that this is a very serious accusation. Jiraiya admits that he can't confirm it, but he's narrowed it down to someone on the village council, and he's had reason to suspect Dunzo from the start. Tsunade asks why, and Jiraiya elaborates, telling her about Dunzo's comment during the meeting before his team's first c rank mission, and his suspicions that the attack that followed has something to do with Nagato. Here Orochimaru speaks up, saying if he were to guess, he would assume Danzo wants the boy's eyes, since the Rinnegan are as rare as they are powerful, and if Danzo is truly as ambitious as Lord Second said, they would be the sort of tool he would crave. Jiraiya seems repulsed by such a thought, but Orochimaru curtly states that like it or not, this is the most probable answer, so Jiraiya must accept it. The legendary pervert solemnly nods, muttering that he's not denying his friend's claim, he just can't imagine what sort of man would steal a child's eyes. Orochimaru retorts that is because Jiraiya lacks ambition, and without it, it would be difficult to understand the lengths one would go to for their desires. But truthfully, he doesn't need to understand Danzo's rationalizations to outwit him, only his motivations, and since he does, the only thing left to do is act. Jiraiya grimly nods, saying though he hates to do it, he'll need to use the kids as bait again, and hope the skills he's taught them will be enough to see them through. The next morning Jiraiya comes to his team with surprising news that he has decided to enter them in the upcoming Chunin exams. Yahiko of course is eager, saying he'll show the examiner how strong he's gotten and become a Chunin in no time, an outlook which Jiraiya encourages, telling his student that it won't be easy, but he believes in him. Conan meanwhile says she doesn't really care about ranking up, but she'll do it to support her teammates. While Nagato asks if there's a reason their sensei suddenly made this decision, Jiraiya explains that while he thinks it will be good experience to help them grow and measure themselves against their peers, he does have a secondary reason. That being his hope that the exam will be a good cover to smoke out their enemy. Stoically, Conan asks if that means he's concluded the enemy is after one of them, and not him. Jiraiya nods, promising that this changes nothing, and he will still be there to protect them with his life. Pragmatic as ever, Conan says such action would be unwise, since if he is not the target, then in the enemy's eyes he is expendable. Better to take a step back and let the three of them take care of each other, while he focuses on watching their back from afar. Nagato and Yahiko both agree with Conan's plan, and Jiraiya is left speechless at the suggestion, having figured the kids would be afraid at the thought of some malicious force from within the village trying to kill them. Instead, they have moved right on to creating a practical solution, and he cannot help but be impressed by their resilience. These thoughts seem to be clearly written on Jiraiya's face. Or perhaps Conan has simply gotten to know her sensei too well, as when she sees this, she smiles and tells him not to worry about them, reminding Jiraiya that they survived the war long before they met him. Laughing at himself, Jiraiya smiles that she's right of course, and for the first time wonders if maybe training these children has made him as sentimental as Orochimaru said. 
With the trio all in agreement, the next week is spent in intensive training, with a heavy focus on ways to combat ambushes, as well as going over the basics of the tuning exams, so that Nagato, Yahiko and Conan can be ready for what is to come. Finally, on the evening before the exams, Jiraiya tells them to take the night off, grinning that if they work any harder, they'll sleep through the exam. He then pulls out a pair of twin stick popsicles, snapping both in half and throwing a stick to each of the kids, before flopping down on the grass with his own trait. Nagato, Yahiko and Conan join him, and the four of them lie back, watching the sky slowly turn from sunset's orange to the indigo of night. As they eat, Nagato asks his sensei if he thinks they'll be able to pass tomorrow, but Jiraiya admits that he doesn't really care if they pass or fail. What matters is that they stay true to themselves in their ninja way. Do that and he'll always be proud of them. The next morning, Team Jiraiya make their way to the Ninja Academy for the first stage of their exams. Jiraiya wishes the three kids luck, then tells them that their first test is just beyond the door at the end of the hall. Eagerly, Yahiko runs ahead, bursting through the door, though what he sees chills him to his core, the exam proctor lying face down in a pool of blood, while a pale black-haired man in the garb of the hidden stone village stands over him with his sword raised. As soon as the stone shinobi makes eye contact with Yaiko, the doors slam shut behind him, sealing them both inside. The invader then shoots the boy an evil look, saying it's a shame he stumbled upon him like this, since Protocol says now he has to kill him too. But as luck would have it, he's willing to cut Yahiko a deal, tell him how to get to the Hokage's office, and he can live. Suspiciously, Yahiko asks what this guy wants with old man Hiruzen, and the stone shinobi blithely replies that he's going to assassinate him, bringing the leaf to its knees and forcing them to surrender to the stone. It'll end the war today, and only cost the life of one old geezer. Pretty good deal in here his opinion. Yahiko snaps back that he wants the war to end too, but this isn't the right way to end it, so the stone shinobi is delusional if he thinks he's going to tell him where the Hokage is. He then draws his tanto and rushes towards the man with a mighty roar. The stone shinobi jeers at Yahiko, asking if he really thinks he's going to defeat him with a butter knife like that, before whipping his sword round and clashing blades with the youth. Not being designed for sword on sword combat, the Tanto shatters cleanly in two, and Yahiko is knocked off his feet, flying backwards and landing on his back. The stone swordsman then levels his blade at Yahiko's throat, telling him the kid has guts which he can respect, so he'll make him the offer one last time. The Hokage's life? Or his? Reluctantly, Yahiko says he's no traitor, so this guy might as well kill him, since he'll never talk. And in response, the stone shinobi shrugs and swings his blade to behead the boy. Yahiko only closes his eyes at the very last second, but instead of feeling the bite of cold steel on his throat, he feels a warm hand clap him on the shoulder as the stone shinobi says he's all done. Opening his eyes, the orange-haired boy finds himself back on his feet, with the stone shinobi now dressed in a leaf village flak jacket, while behind him, Nagato and Conan watch Yahiko with shared concern on their faces. The black-haired man then hands Yahiko a cookie, saying this might help take the edge off, as he explains that he has just passed the first stage of his tuning exams. This only baffles the boy more, but the man seems prepared for this as he allows his black eyes to turn crimson, explaining that when Yahiko and his teammates entered the room, he used his Sharingan to put them all under a Genjutsu. The test was to see what they'd do in a life or death situation, with the three ways to pass being to either break the Genjutsu, defeat the invader, or as Yahiko did, refuse the offer and sacrifice himself for the good of the village. Yahiko then asks what Nagato and Konan did, with Nagato admitting that the Sharingan's Genjutsu didn't work on him, so he just passed automatically. Though after hearing of Yahiko's bravery, a part of him wishes he could have experienced the test, just to be sure that if push came to shove, he would have the guts to do what had to be done the same as Yahiko. Konan, on the other hand, says that she recognized it as a Genjutsu, and so dispelled it a little while before Yahiko finished. Yahiko, still struggling to believe that what he just experienced wasn't reality, asks how Konan could tell it was a Genjutsu. Konan admits that there were two things that tipped her off. The first being that something felt off with her own chakra the moment she stepped into the room, kinda like it wasn't as easily accessible as usual. It's a minor thing, but after all the training she'd put into honing her chakra control for her paper ninjutsu, it stood out to her as odd. Yaiko nods, agreeing that Jiraiya Sensei's always said Konan has impressive chakra control and a knack for details, though he's gotta ask, what's the second reason?
Blushing a little, Conan admits the second reason she knew it was a genjutsu was because Yahiko wasn't there. Yahiko looks confused at this comment, so Conan elaborates, explaining that she knows that if she were ever really in trouble, he wouldn't let anything stop him from helping her, and the fact that he wasn't there for her meant that it couldn't be real. Blushing a little as well at this explanation, Yahiko mumbles that of course he'd do anything for her, walking over so that he can stand with her and Nagato. After a moment, the Uchiha proctor tells the trio they're free to do what they want for the next few hours, but instructs them to be outside training ground 44 at 1pm, since that will be where they receive instructions on in the second stage of the exams. He also encourages them to use this time to relax, since Genjutsu tends to leave people out of sorts for a while, and they'll need to be on top of their games for the next test, since it's even more daunting than the first. Yahiko has to suppress a grimace at this, considering how the first stage ended in his death. But nonetheless, he along with Nagato and Konan nod their understanding then depart the test room. Following a tasty lunch of Ichiraku Ramen, the Genin trio arrive outside Training Ground 44 a little early, and to their surprise find a few dozen people mostly around their own age milling about and chatting amiably. Presumably these are the other Genin who passed the first stage and so not really knowing anyone their own age, Team Jiraiya decide to get to know their peers. As soon as the other Genin spot them, however, a hush falls over their conversations, which in turn is replaced by the sound of low muttering like the buzz of a thousand angry hornets. Most of the other Genin won't even meet their eyes, with those that do shooting Nagato in particular dirty looks. Loudly Yahiko asks what their damn problem is, to which a boy with black hair pulled into a ponytail and a scar along his cheek replies that he shouldn't pay them any mind. They're just jealous since their team has one of the dojutsu duo. Konan asks what the dojutsu duo is, but before the boy can answer, Yahiko grins that if it's something the other teams are jealous of, it's probably got to do with him. Sighing, the boy with the ponytail tells Yahiko that he's not even close since no one's going to be jealous of an idiotic nobody like him. As Yahiko chokes on this insult, the other boy continues, saying it's actually Nagato he was referring to. The way he didn't even fall for the Proctor's Sharingan Genjutsu has got the other Genin on edge, but to make matters worse, there's another guy who also shrugged it off like he was nothing, causing people to start calling them the Dojutsu duo because they both have special eyes. This causes a look of deep curiosity to cross Nagato's face, wondering what this other person's special eyes could be. But he isn't left to wonder for long, as a tall, dark-haired boy with a striking resemblance to the Proctor steps out of the crowd to speak with him. Smiling, he modestly tells Nagato and the other three not to take that sort of gossip seriously, before introducing himself as Fugaku Uchiha. As he and Nagato shake hands, the redhead asks if he'd be correct in assuming that Fugaku's dojutsu is the Sharingan, to which the taller boy nods. He then expresses great interest in Nagato's Rinnegan, saying that should they both pass the second round, he would quite like to face Nagato in the finals. Nagato isn't quite sure what this means, but agrees all the same, saying he eagerly awaits any chance to test his growth as a shinobi. As this transpires, Yahiko and Konan split off to have their own conversations, with Yahiko immediately starting to bicker with the ponytail boy, whose name it turns out is Shikaku Nara. Konan, meanwhile, is almost knocked off her feet when she collides with a girl with honey blonde hair and glasses. Hurriedly, the girl apologizes, saying she wasn't looking where she was going, but Konan says it's fine, introducing herself, and in turn learning the other girl is called Nono. Nono and Konan chat amiably for a while, with the honey-haired girl asking to take a look at Konan's paper flower barrette, and confessing her own worries for the next stage of the exam, considering how she was only added to her team this morning so they could have a third person to compete. Conan in turn shares her worries for the safety of her friends, saying she has reason to believe someone might be trying to hurt them. Comfortingly, Nono smiles that Conan has nothing to worry about, since one of her friends is a member of the Dojutsu duo, so no one would dare to try and hurt their team. Conan breathes that she hopes the other girl is right, before an adult in a flak jacket comes into view, signalling it's time for the second round to begin. With everyone moving to stand with their squad mates, Conan joins Nagato and Yahiko in the front row as the Chunin Proctor begins to explain the second round. He tells them that this training ground has a nickname, the Forest of Death, gained through the numerous little Genin like them it's killed. Their mission will be simple, prove that name wrong and survive for 72 hours within the forest. However, the flora and fauna won't be their only opponents, 
since each of them will be equipped with special kunai and shuriken designed specifically for this test. He then pulls out a shuriken and tosses it into the chest of a blonde boy to Shikaku's left. On impact, the shuriken explodes into black ink which drips down the boy's shirt for a moment. Cocking his head, the boy asks what the purpose of this is, but the Chunin simply tells him to wait for it. About 30 seconds after being hit by the ink shuriken, the boy vanishes with a faint pop, appearing 10 feet in the air and letting out a shriek as he crashes to the ground. The Chunin then explains that anyone hit by the ink will be teleported outside the forest and subsequently eliminated. But that is not all they need to know. From here, teamwork is no longer mandatory, with anyone able to eliminate anyone else. In fact, each of them should think long and hard about whether the value of having their teammates as allies in the forest outweighs the dangers they will pose as potential rivals in the finals. Next, they should know that there is only one bit of shelter in the whole forest, a tower in the middle, so it'd be smart to try and claim it as soon as possible if they don't want to be dinner for the giant man-eating centipedes. Finally, if they want out at any point, all they need to do is hit themselves with one of the ink weapons. It'll count as a forfeit, but it's better to be disqualified than dead. With this cheery thought, each Genin is given a backpack with three ink kunai and six ink shuriken before being assigned one of the 44 gates along with the other two members of their squad. As soon as they get the signal to start, Team Jiraiya head through their gate and into the Forest of Death. None of them even consider turning on each other. In fact, it is quite the opposite, with the trio all having the same plan for how best to keep all three of them in the exam until the end. They all know the function of the tower is likely to bait the more greedy Genin into open battle, and so decide at once to avoid it, knowing that their experience in the Hidden Rain will actually be an advantage here, as unlike most of the other competitors, they are quite comfortable sleeping in the open and foraging for food. They also decide to stick as close as they can to the forest's edge, since it is where the fewest predators are likely to be, while also eliminating one of the possible directions an enemy could attack from. It is a prudent plan, and so the three friends set to work finding a tall and sturdy tree nearby which they can turn into their base of operations. Thankfully in a forest as overgrown as this one, it is not a difficult ask, meaning that within the first hour they have set up camp. However, even with this stability, they do not allow themselves to become complacent, agreeing to have rotating four-hour watches so they can keep their eyes peeled for enemies or dangerous animals. Nagato volunteers to go first, and so climbing to the highest branch sets to work. About two hours into his watch, Nagato sees the vaguely familiar chakra of someone fast approaching, and so figuring it is one of their rivals, draws two shuriken, while telling his friends to be ready. Looking in the direction Nagato pointed, Yaiko and Conan can't see anything, with Conan charitably suggesting that Nagato must be getting tired, and so offers to take over for him early. Nagato shakes his head, saying he can see them quite clearly, pointing once more to the figure who is now running along the tree next to theirs. But this only earns him looks of concern and bewilderment from Yaiko and Conan. Figuring they won't be able to miss the newcomer when they're covered in ink, Nagato throws his shuriken, with both headed directly towards the target thanks to his enhanced vision. Down below, Yaiko and Conan watch the weapons hurtle towards seemingly nothing, but then something strange does happen. With the sound of metal on metal, both shuriken go flying off in random directions in a way that tells them Nagato is not mistaken and someone is definitely out there. Drawing a kunai and raising his voice, Yaiko calls out to the unseen intruder, telling them they can drop the invisibility routine since whatever jutsu they're using can't hide from the Rinnegan. Seeing no point to wasting chakra on a jutsu that grants no benefit, Conan's new friend Nono seemingly materializes from nowhere. However, unlike Nagato and Yaiko, she is not holding either of the exam weapons, instead clutching a dreadfully familiar Tanto blade. As Conan is unarmed, she is deemed the weakest link, and so Nono lunges at her first, thrusting with the knife in a way that would have been fatal had Conan not leapt to the side. Angrily, Yaiko asks what the hell the honey-haired girl thinks she's doing, but Nono ignores him, instead charging at Nagato as he is her primary target. Feeling his temper rising, Yaiko draws his own Tanto and steps in front of Nagato, parrying the attack before once more demanding to know what's going on. However, instead of Nono, it is Nagato who answers, as in a grave voice he tells his friends that he's figured out where he recognizes her chakra from. She's the fake Sandanbu who attacked them during their mission outside the village. In a flat tone, Nono confirms this, then slightly shifts the way she's holding her weapon, applying more pressure to the tip. This in turn causes Yaiko's blade to slip and twist, 
forcing him to relinquish his hold on it as the young assassin scolds that he may use the weapon of the division, but that doesn't mean he knows how to wield it. She then kicks his dropped Tanto off the branch, leaving the orange haired Genin unarmed and at her mercy. This is enough to force Team Jiraiya to surrender, with Conan asking what Nono wants. Not taking her eyes off Yahiko, the other girl gestures at Nagato, saying her mission is to retrieve his eyes, no matter what. There is a faint quiver to Nono's voice as she says this, but even such a small thing does not pass unnoticed by Conan, who says that it sounds like she doesn't really want to hurt Nagato or any of them. Quiver definitely present now, the other girl replies that it doesn't matter what she wants. If she doesn't come back with those eyes, he'll kill her. Nagato asks who'll kill her, suggesting that maybe they can help, but with anguish in her voice, Nono says she can't say. Soothingly, Nagato assures her that she can trust them, but with anger now taking root, the girl once more declares that she can't say, as she lunges at him. Summoning a fireball like Jiraiya since they did during their first battle, Nagato launches the blazing orb at Nono, but the girl shows off her impressive ninja skill by not losing any momentum as she simply changes trajectory, running along the underside of the branch to avoid the fireball, before springing back up and delivering a fearsome slash to Nagato's cheek, narrowly avoiding his eye. Nagato winces in pain, and so Nono goes for another thrust, this time at the boy's throat, but is stopped when a paper shuriken knocks her blade off course. Looking back, she sees Conan, who lobs another few paper projectiles, before body flickering away as the other two members of her team do likewise. Scowling, Nono gives chase as the three Genin reluctantly flee deeper into the forest. Using his Rinnegan, Nagato can see her coming and so warns his friends, but Yaiko grins that he has a plan, telling Nagato to hurl his backpack at her. Nagato complies, and as the bag goes soaring through the air, Yaiko fires off a water bullet jutsu which hits the backpack at high velocity, shredding it and detonating all the ink weapons inside. Mixing with the water bullet, this creates a massive blanket of ink that obscures Nono from view, while also hiding Team Jiraiya from her. Knowing that she can't afford to be forced out of the forest, Nono falls back, allowing Nagato, Conan and Yahiko to escape for now. The trio quickly find a new resting place, but there is little rest to be had as each of their hearts is pounding from what just happened. Nagato and Conan seem more shaken than Yahiko, so he defaults to his old leader role, suggesting the smartest thing they can do is stab themselves with ink kunai and get out of here. Sure it'll suck to fail the exam, but like the proctor said, better to lose than to die. However, Conan disagrees, saying that this might be their best chance to capture one of their enemies alive and see what she knows. Nagato agrees, and since both Yahiko and Conan know that his life will be the one on the line if this plan fails, agree to back him up. A few hours later, Nagato finds himself waiting in a clearing deep in the forest. It does not take him long to see Nono's chakra approaching, but instead of striking a fighting pose, he waits until she is in range, telling her to stop as he pulls up his fringe to reveal a seal on his forehead. Hanging back in case of a trap, the would-be assassin asks what that is, and Nagato tells her that Jiraiya Sensei put this on him before he came to the village, in case anyone tried to steal his eyes. Now if they are ever removed from his head, they'll immediately burst into flames, rendering them useless to anyone, so it seems like her mission's already failed. But that's okay, since like he said before, he and his friends can help her, they just need to know who she's working for. Nono begins to tremor, violently shaking her head in refusal, but Nagato remains undeterred, saying he can see she doesn't want to hurt him. Not really, and he doesn't want to hurt her either. Conan said she seemed like a potential friend before the exam, and he would love to get to know her, but first she has to trust him. By now, Nono's shaking has gotten to the point of almost spasming, and through his enhanced vision, Nagato can see hints of tears in the honey-haired girl's eyes. However, when she takes a deep breath, the shaking stops, and there is nothing but emotionless determination when she looks up at him. Catching her blade for a lethal thrust, Nono tells him that if she cannot take his eyes, she will just take his head instead, and allow her allies to find a way to break the seal later. She then charges forward, as from the trees drops Conan, landing directly between her and Nagato. Wordlessly, Conan stands sentinel, but her presence does nothing to change the stony-faced Nono's trajectory, as she simply runs Conan through with her blade instead. However, instead of blood, the only thing to burst from Conan is a flurry of origami paper. In fact, her entire body explodes into paper, creating a cloud of the stuff all around Nono, 
as the real Conan lands to her left, musing that the paper clone technique still needs work, since it was meant to cry out Nagato's name before it was stabbed. Meanwhile, Yahiko lands behind Nono, firing off an even larger water jutsu which douses her in the paper, turning it into a sopping paste which coats her in the surrounding area. As Nono tries to wipe the slurry from her eyes, an overwhelming heat engulfs her as Nagato breathes fire on the wet paste, rapidly drying and hardening it into a full body cast that immobilizes the assailant. As Nono is frozen in place, Team Jiraiya all approach her, congratulating each other on the first successful usage of their new team jutsu which they dub the Ame style paper prison. Glaring at Nagato as he wipes the fake mud seal off his forehead, Nono coldly growls at him to get it over with and kill her already, since she always knew failing this mission would mean death one way or the other. However, Nagato shakes his head, saying her death would be senseless and cruel. He meant what he said about helping her, and he'd never be able to face his sensei or himself if he went back on it now. Shock eclipsing anger, Nono asks what he's going to do with her, and in a resolute tone, Nagato says she will see, though he's afraid afraid she probably won't like it. From here, Team Jiraiya are able to avoid trouble, hiding out atop their base tree, with Nagato or Yahiko occasionally venturing down to the surface for food or water. Finally, at the end of the third day, they are allowed to leave the Forest of Death, and to their surprise, find that only five others have managed to pass this stage of the exam, those being Shikaku and his teammates, a stranger, and finally Fugaku Uchiha, who gives Nagato an approving nod when he sees that he is also still in the exam. The Chunin Proctor from earlier tells these eight Genin that for their perseverance, they have all earned a spot in the finals, which will be a series of single elimination battles. However, victory in those battles does not guarantee promotion any more than loss forbids it. Instead, it will be a showcase of their skill as shinobi. For that reason, they will each have a month to train so they can best hone their skills for the battles ahead. He then announces the first round matchups, and to his surprise, Nagato finds himself in the third fight of the round, squaring off against Choza Akamichi, one of Shikaku's teammates. But what is more surprising is that Konan and Yahiko are slated to face off against each other in the opening match. Yahiko declares this stinks, demanding that he be given a different opponent since he doesn't want to fight his friend, but the Chunin barks at him to shut up, telling him to follow Conan's example. In this regard, Conan has stayed perfectly still, not saying a word, and barely batting an eyelid at being told she must face her dear friend in combat. Seeing that he has no way to change the decision, Yaiko accepts it, harumphing away as Nagato and Conan follow. When they're out of sight of the competition, Nagato tells Conan that she's done well, and in response she nods, then dissipates, revealing herself to be another paper clone. The boys then hurry back to Jiraiya Sensei's apartment, where he and Conan are waiting. Worriedly, Conan asks if Nagato and Yahiko were okay without her, but Yahiko says it was fine, praising that her paper clone was so convincing that no one suspected a thing. Nagato then asks if Nono gave her any trouble, but Conan shakes her head, saying the transformation jutsu went off without a hitch, and she was able to carry Nono back here without anyone noticing. The redhead then turns to his sensei, asking if he's had any luck getting information out of her. Dark circles line the Jonin's eyes, as if from several late nights, and with a sigh he answers that she's a tough nut to crack, that's for sure, having some sort of seal on her tongue that prevents her from divulging any information on her master. However, he promises that he will keep working and get the information they need. Meanwhile, the three of them can't afford to get distracted, since in one month's time, they'll be competing in front of the whole village, and with Nono now as their prisoner, who knows what tactic their enemy will employ next. For the first time in months, Nagato enjoys a dreamless sleep, having thoroughly exhausted himself during his time in the Forest of Death. When he awakens, the sun is high in the sky, and Yahiko's futon is empty, suggesting his friend is already awake. Stepping into the main room of Jiraiya's apartment, the young Uzumaki finds his friends and sensei enjoying a hearty breakfast, and when she sees him, Konan waves him over, smiling that it looks like he slept well. Returning her smile and taking his place between her and Yahiko, Nagato sighs that he really did, as Yahiko hands him a bowl of rice porridge, which after three days of questionable roots and giant centipede meat, smells like the most appetizing dish in the world. Jirai then explains that they were just discussing what to do with their prisoner, and this draws Nagato's attention away from their food, as he asks if she's alright. 
Chuckling, Geiko lightly chides his best friend for worrying over a girl who not even three days ago tried to murder him for his eyes. But Nagato is unrepentant, repeating the question to his sensei, as well as asking if Nono's had breakfast yet. Smiling at this kind-hearted mentality, Jiraiya laughs that it must have slipped his mind. So if Nagato would like to bring us something to eat, he won't stop him. Thanking his sensei, Nagato rises to his feet, taking his own untouched bowl of food and proceeding down the hall to the room Jiraiya had indicated while speaking of the girl. Truthfully, the Toad Sage is a little surprised even after all this time at the humility and humanity of this boy to not only feel compassion for an enemy but to empathize and to go without so that they don't have to suffer. If all people shared this mindset perhaps the world truly would at last know peace. As Jiraiya watches Nagato's retreating back he truly believes in that moment that one day they will when this boy fulfills his destiny as the child of prophecy. Stepping into the small dark room with its curtains drawn, Nagato is assailed by sudden humidity and the fetid stench of an unwashed body, but he does not allow this to show in his face or tone, instead stepping into the center of the room where a girl tied to a chair glowers up at him. In a pleasant tone, he wishes Nono a good morning, asking if she's hungry and proffering the bowl of porridge. However, the rude assassin spurns this offer, snarling she's not going to crack so easily just because he gives her food. Still smiling, Nagato says he knows that, since Jiraiya Sensei told him about the seal on her tongue, so he's not going to try and interrogate her. He just wants to talk and get to know her a bit better. This pleasant demeanor is met by suspicion, with Nona's eyes darting between the door and window while her lips remain pursed, a fact which disappoints Nagato, but all the same, he offers her a spoonful of porridge. When this too is rebuffed, he just smiles that perhaps she'll feel like it later, laying it aside and beginning to talk, mostly about trivial things, but also sharing some personal details about himself as one would with a new friend. This continues for some time, until eventually Conan comes in to fetch her friend, saying Jiraiya Sensei wants to talk to them. Rising to his feet, Nagato gives Nono one last smile, promising to come back soon and urging her to call out if she needs anything. There is no irony or cruelty to these words, and as the redhead departs, Nono is left with that same feeling of conflict she experienced back in the forest of death. Back in the main room, Jiraiya calls over Nagato and Conan to join him and Yahiko, saying that it's time they discuss their training for the final round of the Chunin exams. Being such a public event, it would be the ideal place for their covert enemy to attempt to assassinate Nagato under the guise of an accident, or else capture one of the other two, in the hopes of inducing him to trade his eyes for their lives. For that reason, he's enlisted specialist teachers for each of them to help them grow their individual strengths over the next month, so that when they step into that arena, they're as best prepared as they can possibly be. Nodding, the three Genin ask who their sensei has chosen for them, and grinning, he replies that he had to pull some strings for this first one, but Conan will be studying under Hiruzen, since if anyone knows how to develop a whole new form of ninjutsu, it's him. Conan is a little surprised by having such a high profile teacher, figuring Jiraiya Sensei would reserve that for Nagato, and so modestly thanks him, while Yahiko claps her on the back, and Nagato smiles that he's certain she will grow immensely under Lord Third. Next up is Yahiko, who will be training with Sakamo Harake, with Jiraiya claiming the White Fang is quite excited to be a teacher, since he was impressed with Yahiko during their mission. Yahiko seems a little disappointed not to be training with Jiraiya, but the Toad Sage gives his orange haired protege an encouraging smile, telling him that this will be good for him, since while while he is flattered how closely Yahiko has based his style on him, the boy needs to find his own path, since that's the only way he can truly surpass his mentor and become the great shinobi Jiraiya knows he can be. At this last statement, tears swim in Yahiko's eyes, which he vigorously wipes away, trying to act tough while promising his sensei that he will make full use of Sakamo's training. Finally, there is Nagato, and with a chuckle, Jiraiya opens by saying that he suspects Nagato isn't going to be thrilled with his choice, but he wants the young Uzumaki to hear him out. Nagato nods, and so Jiraiya reveals that he has arranged for Nagato to spend the next month training under Orochimaru. At once, the mood in the room shifts, with Konan taking a sharp intake of breath, while Yahiko roars that Jiraiya Sensei can't leave Nagato alone with the creepy snake guy, quickly offering to swap spots with his friends and let Nagato train with Sakamo instead. The only one who doesn't react act is Nagato, who stays perfectly still, his eyes locked firmly on Jiraiya. When Yaiko has ceased his tirade, the Toad Sage suggests that perhaps they should ask Nagato himself how he feels about this. And without hesitancy, the boy replies that he can see how much Jiraiya Sensei trusts this man, so he shall try to do the same. 
Understanding the true gravity of this statement, Dry gives his student an appreciative nod before continuing that he's been trying to help Nagato master his Renegade, but truth of the matter is he doesn't know the first thing about being a prodigy, so he's just been fumbling around in the dark trying not to screw up. That's not how things are with Orochimaru though. His fellow Sanin is a natural genius just like Nagato, and with his vast pool of knowledge, he might actually be the one who can help him tap into his powers. Nodding his understanding, Nagato says that he won't let his sensei down, then has won the tree rise, departing at last to begin their separate training. Due to the Hokage's office being the closest destination, Conan is the first to arrive, knocking on Lord Third's door and waiting to be let in. When she enters, Hiruzen greets her warmly, saying that he's very much looking forward to getting her help over the next month, a claim which confuses the girl, as she thought he was meant to be helping her. Nonetheless, Hiruzen presses on, saying that with her paper ninjutsu she will be a great asset around the office, pointing out the stacks of papers piled high on his desk. Not wanting to cause trouble, Conan asks how she can help, with Hiruzen approvingly telling Telling her that her first task will be to send her a notice to every house in the village. Knowing that this would take days to do by foot, Conan takes the first notice and folds it into an origami butterfly, before imbuing it with her chakra and having it fly out the window, a feat which the Hokage applauds, encouraging her to keep it up, while also suggesting the work may go faster if she employs a few of those paper clones Jiraiya was telling him about. Nodding, Conan begins gathering up assorted waste paper from across the room, as well as pulling a few sheets from her collection of origami paper, and using it to manifest a pair of solid doppelgangers, who join her in collecting the notices and sending them out as butterflies. Smiling, Hiruzen watches the girl work, pleased to see that his former apprentice was right both about her creative approach to problem solving and her precise chakra control. All she needs now is a teacher to help her adapt the underlying principles, and with a month to guide her, Hiruzen is confident that he can be that teacher. Meanwhile, Yahiko has made his way to the training field where Sakamo Harake is waiting for him. Having patched things up after the incident at the Hidden Sand Tower, the boy greets his new teacher in a friendly manner, with Sakamo smiling and telling Yahiko that he hopes he's ready for a month of intense training. Yahiko grins that he sure is, taking his fighting stance and drawing his blade. Having lost his original Tanto during the battle with and subsequent escape from Nono, this sword is hers, having been claimed as a spoil of battle after her capture. Though due to both being standard issue root Tantos, there is practically no difference. However, when Sakamo looks at the weapon, it is with a definite frown. A little worried, Yahiko asks the White Fang what's wrong, with Sakamo stating that what the boy has there is a Tanto blade. He then adds with a slightly teasing tone that what the Tanto is best suited for is attacking with finesse and precision, and pardon his saying so, but neither are Yahiko's strengths. He then deftly pulls the sword from his student's hand and adopts a stance very similar to the one Nono did in their battle, couching the blade and thrusting at Yahiko's head. Leaping back with a yelp, Yahiko witnesses as Sakamo impales a wasp that was about to sting the boy's ear with the tip of his blade, the move so precise that the bug remains for the most part intact. Grinning, Yaiko calls this awesome, imploring Sakamo to show him how to do that, but the white-haired man shakes his head, saying he thinks Yaiko is missing his point. While he could spend the month teaching him the nature of precise blade work, it would be a disservice to the boy, since Yaiko would still be but a novice, while his contemporaries would be growing more proficient with their strengths. A better use of their time together would be to identify Yaiko's true strengths and help him improve upon them. Curiously, Yaiko asks if Sakamo has any idea what that strength is, and with a thumbs up, the White Fang replies that he is more than an idea, he's got Yahiko all figured out. Yahiko's greatest strength is his fearlessness, having seen it both in the way the boy ran headlong into battle to protect Conan, as well as his willingness to call out Sakamo himself when he was being an idiot, despite him being his commanding officer at the time. That sort of guts can be harnessed into incredible power, and if Yahiko will let him, he'd like to teach him how to harness it. Nagato's rendezvous point is far less auspicious than his teammates, having been instructed to wait for Orochimaru in an isolated forested area on the outskirts of the village. With the thickness of the trees, the sun is largely hidden from view, and Nagato can't help but think that if the snake sun intended to make good in a suggestion of murdering him from their first encounter, this would be the place to do it. Thankfully it seems Orochimaru has other ideas, as when he approaches it is with only a slightly sinister smile on his pale lips. Surveying Nagato like a lab specimen, the Sanin doesn't bother with a greeting, instead telling the boy that they don't have time to waste, since he only has him for a month, and there are many tests to run. A little perturbed, Nagato says he thought they were training for the Chunin exam finals, but Orochimaru smiles or perhaps smirks would be more accurate, that the boy should consider the possibility that a single act can have more than a single outcome. Their work together should not only assist in Nagato's development, but also help him answer a question that has plagued him his entire life. 
Still a bit hesitant of the Snake Man in spite of what he said to Jiraiya Sensei, Nagato asks what question that is, his turn suggesting that if they are to be working together it must be as partners, not as scientist and guinea pig. Arching his thin brows slightly, Orochimaru replies in a tone that sounds almost like he is impressed with the boy, saying that what he seeks is the key to eternal life. Though he doesn't want to admit it, Nagato can certainly understand the desire, especially if he could gift it to those he loves as well and never lose them. However, he cannot fathom how his presence could help Orochimaru in this quest, and so asks the older man. This elicits an amused sound from the snake Sanin, who responds that it should be obvious, Nagato's Rinnegan. Due to possessing those eyes, Jiraiya believes the boy to be the reincarnation of the Sage of Six Paths, a most fascinating revelation if true, since it would mean that with sufficient power, a person can transcend death and return to the land of the living. A little bashfully, Nagato admits that he isn't so sure, calling Jiraiya Sensei's theory just that, a theory. However, this just makes Orochimaru's smirk grow, as he replies that this is the purpose of their tests, to ascertain the truth or lack thereof in regards to his old teammate's speculation. Still not fully on board, Nagato poses two more questions. First, how? And second, how will this help him develop like Orochimaru said? To this, Orochimaru only needs one answer, saying that they're going to work on granting Nagato the ability to access one or more of the Six Paths' powers at will, since if he can do so as the Sage of Six Paths once did, then that will be the first trace of evidence in favour of Jiraiya's theory. Trying not to sound rude or contrarian, Nagato tells the Snake Sage that while he does want to learn to harness the power of his Rinnegan at will, he's already been trying to do that with Jiraiya Sensei for months, and they haven't been able to achieve anything. With another hint of Rai amusement, Orochimaru replies that that is because they have been doing things Jiraiya's way. His training methods are vastly different from the Toad Sage's, and as Nagato will soon learn, he has a way of getting what he wants from his subjects. And so the month of training begins, with Nagato, Yaiko, and Konan each working hard into their respective masters. Each morning the trio rise bright and early to meet their mentors, and it is often not until late in the evening that all three make it back home. Due to the rigors of this training, the kids seldom have enough energy for more than a quiet meal and then bed, though Nagato does make a point to bring Nono dinner every night and spend a bit of time chatting with her, even if it's just talking about his day. Being a prisoner, Nono refuses to reciprocate this affection, Though with time she does learn to tolerate Nagato's presence, the hatefulness of her glare lessening ever so slightly with each visit. Their bond, as it were, only grows when after days of refusing food or drink, Nono finds herself on the verge of death. Being a trained rude assassin, she is prepared to meet this fate, but Nagato refuses, giving her food and water, and staying up the remainder of the night to ensure she will be okay. When she opens her eyes, she is surprised to see the red-headed boy watching over her, and oddest of all, smiling as though the sight of her awake makes him happier than anything else in the world could. Furiously, Nono demands to know why the hell he saved her when they're enemies, but with an even bigger smile, Nagato replies that he doesn't see them that way. It's like he said before, he wants to be her friend and help her, since though she may not believe it, she is a victim of their unnamed enemy just as much as he is. From here, Nono slowly begins to engage a little more with Nagato, though never touching on the topic of her mysterious master, or any details regarding why she was sent to take the boy's eyes. In turn, Nagato never asks, instead wanting to know more about Nono's interests and her hopes for the future. Even getting this much out of the the girl is difficult, with her claiming that she has no hopes, and that she killed her heart long ago. Though Nagato doesn't believe this, remembering the tears he saw in her eyes in the forest. Nono does however open up a little bit about her history, showing that she too was an orphan who was taken in and trained in the shinobi arts, and for that reason she holds no grudge against Jiraiya or the Rain Trio, since this is simply their way of life. Nagato appreciates this, saying that when the whole ordeal is over, he sure Jiraiya sensei they would be happy to make her a part of their family as well, a claim which seems to trouble Nono, though like with most matters, she holds her tongue and keeps her thoughts to herself. Wanting to prove the sincerity of these words, Nagato goes to Jiraiya and requests that Nono be untied and allowed to move freely around the apartment, an idea which the Toad Sage is understandably not too keen on, pointing out that more likely than not, the second he unties her, she'll try to rip his eyes out again. Smiling, Nagato says he doesn't think she will, admitting he trusts her and truly believes they understand each other. Remembering his hope from the morning after Nagato returned from the Forest of Death, Jiraiya acquiesces, untying Nono and informing her of the conditions of her release. Though he does make 
make a point to mention it would be pretty dumb for her to try and escape, since if what she told the kids in the forest is true, her allies will probably kill her the second she leaves the apartment. Begrudgingly, Nono accepts these terms, and so slowly begins to integrate into the found family's lives, silently helping with chores and joining them for meals, even if she prefers to eat alone in the corner. Yaiko and Conan are still suspicious of her, with Conan feeling a level of personal betrayal at the other girl's attempt to manipulate her, but putting their faith in Nagato, they treat their guest pleasantly, if not necessarily warmly, while Jiraiya remains vigilant as ever, ready to act at a moment's notice if this girl makes a move to hurt his kids. Despite the somewhat tense dynamic, Nagato is happy to watch Nono's rehabilitation, and the time he spends with her and his family become the high point of his days. Admittedly, this is not a particularly high bar to clear, as what Orochimaru calls training, others would call torture. Much of the Snake Sunin's training regimen is comprised of sicking shadow clones on Nagato, and forcing him to use the Predator Path to absorb the barrage of jutsus they hurl at him, having decided that since this is the first path Nagato used, it is theoretically the one he should have the easiest time activating again. It is a cruel, painful, and inhumane way to train, but like it or not, it is effective, with Nagato's survival instincts allowing him to tap into the Sixth Path's power just enough to save his life. And being a scientist, Orochimaru is there to document everything, from what level of danger the boy needs to be in to draw out his power, to what Nagato's mental state is at the moment of activation. Through this he is able to develop more and more precise tests that allow Nagato to narrow down the best way to trigger his Predator Path, with the pair soon concluding that Rinnegan's power does not require a life or death situation, merely for Nagato to manifest it through his will. Unfortunately, even this cannot be simple, as when Nagato tries to will himself to use the Deva path like he did in the Hidden Sand base, he finds himself unable to do so, suggesting that even as he gains proficiency with the Predator path, the other five remain shrouded in mystery. By now their allotted month of training is drawing to a close, and so figuring that the purpose of this month is to acquire and hone a specialization like Jiraiya said, Nagato suggests they should remain focused on mastering the Predator path, rather than trying to branch out. An idea the Snake Sun in is not initially agreeable on, with him having wanted to see all six paths for himself. However, being a man of logic, he hears his subject's proposition out, with Nagato reasoning that a well-honed Predator path will not only help gauge the extent of a Rinnegan Jutsu's strength, but will also be the most useful path in the finals, which as he points out is why he's doing these tests in the first place. Reluctantly, Orochimaru accepts this premise and acquiesces to the plan, little knowing that Nagato has another reason entirely to want greater control of that particular path. Meanwhile, Kona and Yahiko's trainings are also beginning to bear fruit, with Yahiko having learned a few close-range jutsu that supplement his speed and taijutsu, while also beginning to work on a new jutsu of his own under the watchful eye of Sakamo. Conan's success is a less combat-based, at least upon first glance, as she has completely optimized the Hokage's filing system through her paper ninjutsu, as well as created effective inter-office memos thanks to her origami butterflies. It is through these two successes, and a little unseen prodding from Hiruzen, that Conan is able to come up with an idea to create paper wings for herself, since flight would vastly increase the space in which she could move, while giving her a distinct advantage against those ill-equipped to fight at range. Hiruzen praises this idea, and even assists Conan in bringing it to life with his vast stores of knowledge, truly earning his epithet of the Professor. He also assists her in combining jutsu such as her wings with paper shurikens, to create a long-range method of attack which will allow her to protect herself from those who are skilled at distance fighting, granting a well-rounded offense and defense. Finally, the month of training comes to an end, and the day of the Chunin exam finals arrives. Nagato, Yahiko, and Conan each feel ready to show off all they have worked to achieve, but before they step foot in the arena, Jiraiya pulls them all aside, sagely warning them all to watch out for any sort of trap laid by their enemy, citing their relative inactivity over the last month as a cause of concern. The trio of Genin all promise to be careful, then with determined looks on their faces, enter the arena. The first match of the day is slated to be Yahiko vs Conan, however here the audience are disappointed, as when both step onto the field, Yahiko makes a shocking declaration that he forfeits. From the Hokage's box, here is an ask the orange head lad why he's doing this, to which Yahiko replies that he's thought long and hard about it, and he's not going to fight and hurt one of his best friends, even if that means he doesn't get to become a Chunin. Giving the boy a piercing look, here is an ask if Yahiko is sure, since he runs the risk of falling behind his friends if he makes this choice, jutting his chin out in a sign of stubborn determination. Yahiko says that he is. He then turns his back on the audience and heads for the exit, stopping only to encourage Conan to make it all the way to the finals for both of them. 
Next up is Fugaku vs Inoichi, and it is almost as short as Yaiko and Conan's match, as before the Yamanaka boy can act, the flashing red of Fugaku's Sharingan place him under Genjutsu, from which he cannot escape, allowing the Uchiha to casually stroll over and place a kunai to Inoichi's neck, securing the victory. Finally it is time for Nagato to face Choza Akamichi, with Choza proving himself to be a burly young man who towers over his skinny opponent. However, in spite of his smaller stature, Nagato is faster, a crucial trait in this fight, as with what he has planned, and he who strikes first will surely win. And fortunately for Nagato, this is him, as when Choza goes to perform the ram hand seal, he's able to grab hold of the other boy's wrist with both hands. For a moment, nothing happens, but this is exactly in accordance with Nagato's plan, as Choza is forced to realize that something is siphoning his chakra. Solemnly, the Rain Boy explains that this is one of his six paths powers, which allows him to absorb chakra, and so as long as he is touching Choza, the Rotund Boy will be unable to use chakra without it getting drawn to him instead. Unfortunately for Nagato, this does not inspire the other boy to forfeit as he had hoped, but instead to hit him as hard as he can with his free hand, trying to dislodge the little squirt and regain full usage of his chakra. Between the fact that Choza is using his offhand, and the fatigue from having his chakra rapidly depleted, this punch is not as powerful as it could have been. But all the same, blood spurts from Nagato's nose and causes him to briefly see stars. Thankfully, the bigger boy is not given a chance to throw a second hit, as by now he is feeling quite woozy from the chakra depletion, and before he can ball his fist up again, Choza falls backwards with a heavy thump, having been rendered unconscious. And just like that, Nagato has made it to the second round alongside Konan and Fugaku, with both congratulating the young redhead, while Nagato himself approaches Choza after he awakens, thanking him for helping him confirm that his training has really paid off, and he can truly access the Preda path at will. Soon after this, the last semi-finalist is decided, with it being Shikaku Nara. However, upon seeing who he is slayed to fight, he hastily withdraws, saying he isn't stupid enough to go up against a guy with the eyes of a god. As a result, Nagato is immediately advanced to the finals, while Konan and Fugaku square off for the chance to join him there. Up in the stands, Jiraiya and Yahiko cheer Konan on as she re-enters the battlefield, though this time she comes equipped with something neither of them have ever seen before, wings made of hundreds of pieces of origami paper. On the proctor's order to start, Konan takes to the air with impressive speed, hurling a volley of paper shurikens down at Fugaku. Deftly, the Uchiha boy employs a fireball jutsu to burn these order cinders, though to his surprise when the fire makes contact, the shurikens detonate, revealing themselves to have been made of paper bombs. The force of this chain reaction is enough to knock Fugaku off his feet, and this is just the opening Conan is looking for, detaching her wings and dropping back down to the ground, as on either side of her the wings become a pair of paper clones with kunai drawn. The trio of Conans then point their blades at their downed foe, ordering him to yield, but the future Uchiha clan head has other plans it seems, breathing fire at the Conans in an attempt to incinerate the clones and stun the real one. Making the hand sign to release the clones, Conan calls the paper that made them back to herself as wings to prevent them from being burned away, and this gives Fugaku a vital piece of information. Conan only has a finite paper supply. If he can get rid of it, she will be vulnerable. This immediately becomes his new objective, spitting fireballs in rapid succession in the hope of catching Conan's wings. Thankfully, the clever girl is able to avoid this by returning to the sky and reaching an altitude beyond the range of his attacks. From here, she is able to safely rain paper shurikens down on Fugaku, and not wanting to fall for the explosion tag trick again, the young man simply responds by knocking away those that get near with a pair of kunai. This creates a stalemate, or so it would seem, as after a few volleys of paper shurikens, Conan is able to achieve her true objective, forming the scattered papers into a clone directly behind Fugaku, who lays a blade to his throat before he can act. With both hands full, and no way to turn and breathe fire on this clone before she can stab him in the neck, it seems the defeat is truly inevitable for Fugaku. The young Uchiha even tells his opponent as much, saying this well-planned strategy could defeat anyone, except him that is, since he has an ability beyond that of even the most powerful living Uchiha. A gift not seen since the days of Madara, born of the horrors of this war, behold his wicked eye. At once, Fugaku's Sharingan begins to change shape, with curved lines shooting out from the pupil while blood runs down his cheek. And as these new eyes gaze fall upon the paper clone's wrist, she bursts into flames. But not just any flames, these are pitch black. The clone's immolation is so instantaneous that Konan cannot even recover the paper. And as the Uchiha boy looks up at her, the tips of her wings also catch alight with these black flames. Calmly, Fugaku tells her that Amaterasu is an unstoppable flame that will burn until its target is less than ash. So she is two choices, burn to death or release her wings, and he will catch her, though when he does, it will mean the end of their battle. Being level-headed enough to know that promotion is not worth dying over, Conan detaches from her wings and drops into Fugaku's waiting arms. As expected, he immediately lays a kunai against her throat, and with a silent nod, Conan acknowledges his victory, forfeiting the fight.
As the crowd applauds, Conan returns to her feet, while Fugaku offers her a hand to shake, repeating his praise that her strategy would have defeated anyone but him, as well as adding that she pushed him to reveal the secret of his Mangekyo Sharingan, a feat no ordinary ninja could have been capable of. Smiling, Conan thanks him, accepting the handshake, while ignoring the distant sound of Yaiko screaming that Fugaku is a dirty cheat for using weird coloured fire. After a brief intermission in which Nagato congratulates Konan and is in turn wished luck by her for the final match, Fugaku and Nagato take their places on the field. Unlike Konan, Fugaku doesn't wait in this battle, having already ascertained enough about Nagato to immediately go on the attack. Knowing that Ninjutsu and Genjutsu are all but useless against the Rinnegan, the older boy decides to rely on Uchiha's specialty, Shurikenjutsu, as the fight with Choza has already proved that when hit, Nagato will bleed. However, as Fugaku is about to find out, the Rinnegan's perception is not to be tried with. As drawing a pair of kunai, Nagato is able to deflect his assault before rushing in, hoping to end things quickly like he did in his first match. Refusing to allow himself to go down so easily, Fugaku tests the theory, dropping a smoke bomb and darting slightly to the side. A moment later, Nagato emerges from where Fugaku was rather than where he should have been, and this tells the young Uchiha all he needs to know, that there are ways to obscure the Rinnegan's vision. Dropping another smoke bomb, Fugaku now rushes in, hoping to make use of hit and run taijutsu to clinch the match in his favour. However, the younger boy is not out of tricks either, using Fugaku's own fire breathing to form a protective circle of flame around himself and force Fugaku back. As a result, Fugaku reverts to his original plan of throwing weapons, and unfortunately for Nagato, he has grown dependent on his perfect vision, meaning that without it, he is able to be struck with a few of these. Or rather, his shadow clone is. And as the doppelganger pops out of existence, the real Nagato emerges having used Nono's camouflage jutsu in the cover of the first smoke bomb to stay hidden, or relying on Fugaku's single-minded desire to end things to keep him from searching for signs of deception. Cursing himself for falling for the oldest trick in the shinobi book, Fugaku retreats, belching a fireball at Nagato as he goes. The young redhead easily manifests the bubble around himself which absorbs the attack, but this provides Fugaku with valuable albeit unwelcome information. Nagato wasn't bluffing about absorbing any chakra sent his way. It was unlikely that he would be, but after that sneak attack, he wasn't about to take anything on face value. Weighing his options, Fugaku has to admit that things don't look great. Ninjutsu will be consumed by the Rinnegan, Shuriken Jutsu can be deflected, and Taijutsu runs the risk of Nagato grabbing him and knocking him out like Choza, but then it hits him. Something about Nagato's fighting style that he didn't notice, until replaying all the boy's actions back in his head, Nagato isn't fighting back. Throughout both his battles, he has not made a single offensive maneuver, having painlessly defeated Choza and only drawn weapons and used ninjutsu in their fight as a defense mechanism. Even now, when his opponent is retreating, Nagato hasn't made any move to attack, instead choosing to enter taijutsu range, an area of ninja combat his Rinnegan gives him no protection from so that he can grapple Fugaku and absorb his chakra, thus taking him out in a single blow. It is a noble intention, but in the shinobi world, such intentions seldom end well. Calling out to Nagato, Fugaku informs him that he's figured out his plan before encouraging him to give up on this pacifistic approach. However, there is no scorn or condemnation in his tone as he says this. Instead, Fugaku addresses his young opponent with the utmost respect, his message clearly coming from a desire to see Nagato survive. Recognizing this, Nagato thanks Fugaku, though declares that to abandon this style would be to go back on his ninja way, and that is something he cannot do. So even if it costs him his life, he will never allow his actions to further the cycle of violence and hate. Hatred. Such passion from the normally quiet Nagato drives the air from Fugaku's lungs. This feeling, it is as powerful as the killing intent he has felt on the battlefield, but there is no malice to it. It is pure and bright like a ray of sunlight, and as one does when staring directly into the sun, Fugaku is briefly blinded, allowing Nagato to close the distance and grab hold of his hand. At once the Uchiha boy feels his chakra being depleted, and though he could probably break free with his kunai and prolong their fight, he finds that he doesn't want to, instead twisting his caught hand to form the unison sign with Nagato, as with a smile, he congratulates him on his victory. All around the two boys, the crowd applauds, and it is with great pride in his voice that Hiruzen calls an end to the tuning exams. Following this, Nagato reunites with Konan, Yaiko, and Jiraiya, the latter of whom is especially proud of his student for sticking to his convictions. He then offers to take them all out for dinner, but with a serious look, Nagato says there's one thing he has to do back home first. Not sure what's on the boy's mind, but recognizing the severity of his tone, Jiraiya gives his blessing, telling Nagato to meet them at the ramen place when he's done. The family of four then go their separate ways, with Nagato leaping 
jumping from rooftop to rooftop so he can get back to Jiraiya's apartment as soon as he can. Entering through the window, Nagato makes straight for his destination, Nono's room. In an attempt to make her a bit more comfortable, Jiraiya has provided a futon and some basic amenities, but it's still a fairly spartan sight that meets his eye when Nono lets him in. Spotting his resolute expression, which is so unlike his usual kind look, the girl feels compelled to ask what happened, and in a soft voice, Nagato replies that he thinks he knows how to help her now, he just needs her to please open her mouth. Having on some subconscious level grown to trust him, Nono complies, and as she does this, the boy extends a hand, laying it across the lower half of her face. On instinct, Nono goes to snap at him and demand he stop whatever this is, but before she can make a sound, she feels a slight itchiness on the back of her tongue. Seeing this in her eyes, Nagato retracts his hand, then with a smile says that if his theory is correct, her seal should be gone, meaning that she is finally free of whatever hold her mysterious master has on her. Truthfully, Nono cannot believe it, having accepted long ago that she would be bound to the root until she died. But as she looks into those odd purple eyes that she was sent to steal, the eyes of a boy who despite having every reason not to, has treated her with more compassion than anyone she has ever known, she wants to believe him. And so taking a shaky breath, she begins to utter words that she should not be physically capable of. Danzo Shimura. The man who sent me after you is Danzo Shimura. Several days have passed since the end of the tuning exams, and after careful deliberation, Hiruzen has summoned the finalists and their senseis to the Hokage's office to hear the announcement of who will be promoted. When Team Jiraiya arrives, they spot four neatly wrapped packages on Lord Third's desk, each containing the green flak jacket and blue shirt and pants of a leaf tuning. Looking around, it doesn't take a mathematician to realize that that means only half of them are to be made tuning. And so as Lord Third calls for their attention, the eight aspiring tuning stand at attention, ready to hear the Hokage's verdict. Clearing his throat, Hiruzen opens by saying that he is immensely proud of each of the young shinobi who partook in the Chunin exams, claiming that regardless of today's outcome, he believes they are all a credit to the village. However, only a select few of them have truly demonstrated the mark of a Chunin, and to them he would like to give his special congratulations. The first name called forth is a surprise to no one, that being Nagato, with Lord Third stating that his skill alone makes him worthy of this promotion but the control and compassion he exhibited are a credit to his sensei's teaching. Stepping forth, Nagato shakes the Hokage's hand and is handed his package before Hiruzen moves on to the next name, Fugaku Uchiha, for his ninjutsu prowess and tactical aptitude. Likewise, Fugaku shakes hands with Hiruzen and is given a flak jacket, then steps back so the third new chunin can be announced. Another name that garners no surprise from anyone except for the person herself is Konan, who looks delightedly shocked as she is named the third new tuning. Smiling, Hiruzen credits her innovation on level head while under fire, before handing her the wrapped package and naming the recipient of the final flak jacket on his desk, Shikaku Nara for analytical thinking in the face of danger. With all four promotions dispensed, Hiruzen dismisses the assembled shinobi, with those who accompanied the new tuning rushing over to congratulate them. For Konan and Nagato, this is Jiraiya and Yahiko, with both beaming at the other pair. Humbly, Nagato thanks his sensei and friend for all their well wishes, while in a soft commiserating voice, Konan pats Yahiko on the shoulder, saying she's sorry he didn't get promoted too. However, Yahiko doesn't allow his grin to falter for a second, telling Konan not to worry about him, today is about their achievement, and he couldn't be happier for his two best friends. There is such genuineness to his words that Konan can't help but smile, and as Jiraiya reaches down to ruffle the boy's orange hair, Hiruzen clears his throat for a second time, feigning surprise, and saying it seems he misplaced the final flag jacket. He then pulls a fifth wrapped package from his desk drawer and beckons Yahiko to approach him. Looking shocked, Yahiko does as he's bid, and with a grandfatherly smile, the third Hokage presents him with the bundle, proudly stating that for loyalty and strength of character, in the face of both pressure and disappointment, he is happy to name him a Chunin. For once, the usually talkative Yahiko is at a loss for words, though Nagato, Konan, and Jiraiya are more than capable of picking up the slack, giving their applause as Konan wraps Yahiko in a hug and Nagato claps him on the back. It is a moment of purest joy, and for a time there is only the four of them, though as the others begin to file out, Jirai is forced to break off from his kids, telling them to wait outside, and that he will take them all out for dinner to celebrate, but first he needs a word with his old sensei. 
When they are alone, Jiraiya's entire demeanor shifts, as he at last confides in Hiruzen about the assassination attempts he and his squad have been fending off since their formation. Naturally, this troubles the old man greatly, with him asking if Jiraiya has any leads on who might be the culprit. And still grim, the Toad Sage replies that he knows who it is. It's Danzo Shimura. Stroking his goatee in deep contemplation, the Hokage asks if Jiraiya has any proof of this, calling it a grave accusation. Though with a sigh, Jiraiya is forced to admit that the only evidence he has is the word of the would-be assassin who his team were able to capture, though all she said lines up with his own investigation, so he is inclined to believe her. Nodding, Hiruzen asked to speak with the girl, suggesting that if she were turned over to the interrogation corps, they would be able to ascertain the veracity of her claims quite easily. However, here Jirai is forced to decline, saying that he can't do that, since with Danzo's full influence being unknown, he is concerned she would be killed if she left the safety of his apartment. That is why he didn't bring her with him today. So, Hiruzen tells the gutsy Sani that in that case, he's afraid he cannot render any assistance, since there simply is not enough proof to act against one of his most trusted advisors, even if it is for the sake of one of his former pupils. Turning and heading for the door, Jiraiya says he completely understands, though he promises that he will find a way to prove Danzo's guilt and protect his kids, no matter what it takes. Meanwhile, deep underground, in a place where even the moon's faint light cannot reach, another pair are deep in conversation. The younger of the two, a girl with honey-coloured hair, has taken a knee in front of her superior, her voice soft as she apologises for being absent from his service for so long. Standing over her, Danzo Shimura surveys the girl impassively, his tone mild as he asks what prompted this delay, reminding her that her mission was meant to have concluded more than a month ago, a mission it seems she has failed, he might add. Nervously, Nona replies that she was captured by the enemy, though she used this to her advantage, using the fact that no information could be extracted from her to instead extract information from them. During her time as their captive, she was able to learn about their target and even earn Nagato's trust, making now the perfect time to acquire his eyes for the route. Curiously, Danzo asks why she has not done so then, but with a tremble to her voice, Nono answers that she cannot do it alone. Nagato's eyes have a seal on them, so she requires help capturing him alive, hence why she is return to her master now to request his aid. Lip curling, Danzo states that he cannot be seen attacking the boy himself if that is what she is proposing, but Nono hastily shakes her head, saying she would never endanger him like that. She simply wants a small squad of root agents, perhaps six or so to help her capture the boy, and if needed overpower Jiraiya and his other two subordinates. Briefly, Danzo pauses if weighing his options, before finally acquiescing, telling Nono she may have her wish, though only because the information she has gathered is valuable valuable enough to excuse the multiple failures she's had on this mission thus far. Thanking Danzo profusely, Nono rises to her feet and runs deeper into the root base to assemble her fellow operatives and return to Jiraiya's apartment where they will lie in wait. Night has well and truly fallen by the time the seven cloaked and masked figures return with their prey, a tearful Nagato with a bruise across his left cheek that suggests he did not come quietly. Removing her mask and stepping forward, Nono once more takes a knee in front of Danzo, stating that as ordered, she has captured Nagato Uzumaki so that he may take his eyes. Nodding approvingly, Danzo calls this well done, pleasure in his reedy voice, until a sudden cold snap fills it, forcing Nono to look up in shock. Anger flashes in the root leader's single visible eye as he asks if Nono really thought he would fall for such an obvious ruse. Her story was too plausible, too neat, and as they of the root know, the truth is seldom the believable story people choose to accept. He knew her game from the moment she returned to their base, and so laid his own trap. And just like the gullible child she is, she has brought Nagato and her co-conspirators into the place where his control is absolute. So he supposes in her own way, she did prove useful in the end. At this declaration, dozens of robed and masked root members disengage their camouflage jutsus and drop down from various catwalks lining the base. Throwing off his own mask, the tallest of Nagato's seeming captors reveals himself to be Jiraiya, and in a commanding tone, orders his allies to protect the boy. At once, the six of the shinobi, including Nono, form a defensive circle around Nagato, ready to begin their assault on the root's stronghold and end their war with Danzo one way or the other.
Flashing back to several days earlier, we see Nono and Nagato seated across from Yahiko, Conan, and Jiraiya, with the honey-haired girl having divulged everything she knows about the root and its leader. Yahiko and Conan are both silent, troubled by the fact that such an insidious force holds this much power in the village. But Jiraiya is more proactive, telling his students and Nono that now they know what they know, they have no choice but to uproot the root and free Konoha from its chokehold, both for their own sake and the sake of the village. Mischievous Grun returns Turning to his face, Yaiko replies that obviously Jiraiya Sensei can count on him to fight the bad guys, while the other three children all add their agreement. However, Jiraiya sighs it will take more than the five of them to complete an undertaking of this magnitude, so for that reason he's going to get a bit of help from their friends, specifically Tsunade and Orochimaru. He would also like Yaiko to request Sakamo Hadake's help if he is able, since with the combined power of the Sanin and the White Fang, they might be able to defeat Danzo and his cronies. Fortunately, all three of their additional allies are willing to help, joining the now expanded Team Jiraiya as they plot how best to defeat their phantom enemy. As with all good plans, it has layers of contingencies, allowing them to adapt as circumstances change, with the initial plan simply being to present their evidence to Hiruzen and hope he feels compelled to act. However, none of them truly believe it will be this simple, and so they decide to enact their first backup plan at the same time, having Nono return to Danzo under the pretense of still being on his side. This has two benefits. The first, that it keeps Danzo occupied while Jiraiya speaks to Lord Third, and the second it puts the plan in motion before Danzo can hear of the meeting and grow suspicious. Assuming that Hiruzen does not accept their story on face value, Nono will request a contingent of rude operatives matching their number to storm Jiraiya's apartment, where Sakamo, Orochimaru, and Tsunade will be waiting to ambush them. Once they are defeated, the heroes can use the Root's depersonalizing uniform to their advantage, disguising themselves as the operatives and returning to the stronghold, having seemingly captured Nagato. Initially, Jiraiya tells Nono that she will only have to request four allies, enough for himself, his fellow Sanin, and Sakamo. But he, Yaiko and Konan protest, stridently declaring that if Nagato's going into that awful place, they're going with him. Pulling rank, Jiraiya says they most certainly are not. It's bad enough he has to endanger one of them. There is no way he's risking all three of their lives. But with a faint chuckle, Orochimaru tells his colleague not to waste his breath. This pair have already set their mind on going. And if they're as much like Jiraiya and Tsunade as he's been led to believe, arguing will achieve nothing except waste time they do not have. He then turns his amber eyes onto Yaiko and Konan, and in a silken hiss tells them that very well they may join the assault, but their lives are in their own hands, so they had best be certain they have the resolve and skill to see this task through to the end. Gulping, Yaiko says that they are, while Konan nods for agreement, cementing the decision that will be a party of eight who conduct the raid. Finally, the day of the operation arrives, and as Team Jiraiya prepares to leave for the Chunin promotion ceremony, having chosen now as a time for Jiraiya to speak to Hiruzen without seeming out of place, and Nono readies herself for her audience with Danzo, Nagato pulls the glasses-clad girl aside. Quietly, he asks if she's sure she wants to do this, citing the danger she'll be putting herself in, since Danzo may well simply kill her on sight. Stoically, Nono reminds him that they do have a contingency plan in case she is killed, but Nagato protests that isn't his point. He doesn't like the people he cares about risking themselves for his sake, and that includes her. A faint smile playing on her lips, Nono assures him that she will be fine. After all, he has already saved her life on three separate occasions, so she will not leave his side until she has returned the favor. Mark her words. Thankfully, Dunzo does not make a liar of her, and the first stage of the backup plan goes off without a hitch, allowing Nono to lead six unwitting root operatives back to Jiraiya's apartment, where Orochimaru, Sunade, and Sakamo lie in wait. Here's Tsunade's taijutsu mastery, as well as her knowledge of human anatomy comes in handy, as she's able to defeat the assailants without the need of weapons, while also avoiding any injury that might spill blood on the cloaks or masks, since even such a subtle imperfection might blow their cover. Finally, Team Jirai returns from the celebratory dinner, having needed to keep up appearances in case Danzo had them under surveillance, and with the team assembled at last, they don their disguises and leave the rest up to fate. Back in the present, the eight invaders begin their battle with the seemingly endless horde of Root Shinobi, all of whom are more than willing to lay down their lives in the pursuit of Danzo's order to seize Nagato and kill the rest. Thankfully, the heroes are not opposed to using lethal force against their enemies, least of all Orochimaru, who launches a brutal bevy of snakes, which latch onto the limbs and necks of their unfortunate victims, downing them with their excruciating venom. Sakamo Harake, having spent so long on the front line, is also unafraid to kill, his chakra saber cutting apart 
path through the road operatives that allow the others to advance on Danzo. Fortunately, they had planned for the eventuality where he saw through their deception, and so have two primary plans to solve this issue. Either capture the root leader to present to Hiruzen, or kill him, and accept whatever consequences may arise, with the knowledge that at least the threat he poses is at an end. However, it seems Dunzo was not exaggerating when he stated he had absolute control here in the base, as when Jiraiya draws near enough to launch a fireball jutsu at him, Dunzo deftly enacts a substitution jutsu, appearing on a higher catwalk and glaring down at the invaders with disdain. Coldly, he names the group as traitors to the leaf, expressing special disgust for the Sanin as students of the Hokage. Angrily, Yaiko yells up that the old creep is the real traitor, manipulating everyone from the shadows, but Dunzo dismissively chides that this loudmouthed child knows nothing of the true cost of peace, security, and order. On Wii in his voice, Jiraiya acknowledges that he understands what Danzo is trying to do, and even agrees with some of it. A spy network is necessary to protect Konoha, but Danzo has perverted the idea, with the route only serving Danzo's ends and not the Leafs. Acidly, Danzo protests the two are one in the same, since everything he's done has been for his village. But with a scowl, Tsunade asks how ordering the murder of a child helps Konoha. Sighing as if talking to an impudent child, Danzo replies that Nagato is an outsider with a godly dojutsu. Perhaps today his loyalty lies with them, but what if tomorrow he decides to return to his birth village and seek retribution for all the damage Konoha has done there? If the leaf is to be truly safe, the power of the Rinnegan must be in the hands of someone whose loyalty is unquestionably and unwaverably with Konoha. Surely they can all see that at least. Smirking from atop the corpse pile his snakes have created, Orochimaru counters that as Danzo himself has said, loyalties can change, so truthfully, even he is not the safe option he presents himself as. Nodding, Jiraiya adds his voice to his friends, saying that Orochimaru is right, and that the best thing they can do for Konoha is ensure Nagato is raised to be a true shinobi of the leaf, since he truly believes that if he is, one day he will lead a revolution of peace throughout the entire world. At these words, Danzo's scowl only grows. And with keen insight, Tsunade tells her teammates to save it. Despite his claims, Dunzo doesn't really want peace. He just wants power, and will take it however he can. So like it or not, they have to stop him here. This earns a rumbling of agreement from the other seven heroes, who begin to form up on each other, preparing to follow Dunzo up to the higher catwalk. But the root leader has other ideas, it seems, as with his agents now all defeated, he resorts to his next best defense, the mighty elephant chimera Baku. With a trumpet of its long snout, the Baku Baku is summoned onto the same level as the raid team, its fearsome size and savage demeanor making it quite the threat. However, the heroes cannot focus solely on it, as once his beast has been called forth, Danzo ducks into a passageway clearly attempting to escape. Having no time for debate, Sakamo states that he will stay behind to fend off the Baku, while Orochimaru adds that he will do likewise, since if this really is the fabled creature of nightmares, even the White Fang may not be enough to defeat it. Smiling, Sakamo expresses gratitude for the help, unaware that truthfully Orochimaru just wants to study the monster, while Sanade announces her own intention to stay and provide medical support, since she imagines the Baku has a greater chance of dealing serious injury than Danzo on his own. In a grim tone, Nono tells the older woman not to underestimate Danzo Danzo, since there is a reason he has managed to maintain his power for so long. But all the same, she follows Jiraiya and his trio of now tuning subordinates as they run up the wall and leap through the passage Danzo fled through. Though Danzo is admittedly past his prime, he is still quite athletic, having a good head start on Team Jiraiya, and it is only thanks to the lanterns lining the passage that they are able to keep track of him. Not wanting to lose their quarry, Kunan brings out her restocked supply of origami paper and summons a pair of wings, allowing her to take to the air and fly over Danzo head. Landing gracefully, she begins to assail the root leader with paper shurikens, forcing him to slow his running to parry them, and thus allow the others to catch up with him. With Nagato, Nono, Yahiko, and Jiraiya on one side, and Konan with a pair of newly formed paper clones on the other, it seems that Danzo is well and truly cornered. Though as the heroes are about to learn, he is not known as the Shinobi of Darkness for his strict adherence to fighting fairly. Making the clone hand seal, Danzo creates a trio of shadow clones, each facing a different direction, so that together the four of them create a box while covering each other's blind spots. They then all take a deep breath and expel a torrent of cutting winds, which force Team Jiraiya to dive to the floor as the steel ceiling and wall are shredded by the cutting power of the gale. This creates just the opening Danzo needs, and so kicking Konan into the wall with a painful thump, Danzo and his trio of doppelgangers push onwards. Worriedly, Jiraiya asks if his student is okay, but she attests 
suggests that she is fine, getting to her feet with the others and following after Dunzo once more as they at last exit this corridor. The next section of the route base is a cross section of two corresponding catwalks, forming an X intersection, and as soon as Team Jirai step onto it, they know something is wrong. With his Rinnegan, Nagato can see the trio of camouflage Dunzo clones, and so yells for his friends to get back, as suddenly all three open fire with wind bullets, turning the center of the intersection into a kill box. Leaping back, Team Jiraiya told the Danzos to give up the games, and seeing no need to expend chakra on a useless jutsu, they all remove their camouflage then step forward to challenge their opponents. Wisely, Jiraiya doesn't underestimate these clones, even if they are only a quarter of the original's power, and so tells the kids to pair up as they fight them, before throwing himself at the middle Danzo. Yaiko with Conan at his side do likewise with the right hand Danzo, leaving the one on the left for Nagato and Nono. Back in the entry area, Tsunade, Orochimaru and Sakamo are still entrenched in battle with the Baku. Despite her claims of sticking to medical support, Tsunade can't help but get involved in the fight, having already punched the creature of Nightmare in the trunk with enough force to buckle the armor at the base of it. Meanwhile, Orochimaru has made good use of his snakes to attack from afar, having dozens of the nasty little critters bite any part of the Baku they can get their fangs into, injecting it with painful venom that only seems to make it more ornery, with it stomping on most of the serpents as it thrashes about. Thankfully, Sakamo, who is leading the assault, has the nimbleness to dodge and weave around this tantrum, darting in and out with lightning speed and slashing at the beast with his chakra saber. This is just as aggravating to the Baku as the snakes, and so wanting to be rid of this pest, it begins employing the legendary suction power of its trunk to try and suck Sakamo up. Smiling, Sakamo asks if the two remaining Sunning can handle things on their own for a while, and when he is met with offended sounds from both Orochimaru and Tsunade, who don't like the idea of this man looking down on them, he lets out a chuckle and dives headlong into the monster's snout, vanishing from view. Returning to Team Jiraiya, they are still fighting the three Danzos, with each employing different strategies which make them uniquely annoying foes. Having deemed Jiraiya the biggest threat, his Danzo clone chooses not to fight him, but to instead attack the kids, with Jiraiya being forced to take drastic action and reverse summon both of them into the stomach of a barrier toad, where Danzo cannot hurt his students and Nono. Even in this confined space, Danzo is wily, using his wind wave jutsu to attempt to slice Jiraiya in half, or else cut his way to freedom. But this is the Toad Sage's domain, and so leaping out of the way like a great toad, he makes use of his wild lion's mane technique to grab hold of the Danzo clone and hurl him into the toad's stomach acid, where he disintegrates with a pop and a fizz. Meanwhile, the four kids are each locked in their own death struggle with the other two Danzos. Nagato and Nono's has drawn a kunai, and after enhancing its blade with wind chakra, has begun a duel with Nono, who thanks to Yaiko has her old Tonto blade back. Speaking of the orange-haired boy, he and Conan have been working hard to try and close the distance between them and their Danzo, as he keeps using cutting winds to neutralize Conan's paper ninjutsu. Each time he does, Yaiko sweats a bit more, worrying that this will be the time he sees Conan cut to ribbons, but the resourceful girl is far from a liability, instead taking to the air on paper wings to draw Danzo's attention. Knowing this might be his one and only chance to employ the technique he and Sakamo created during the month of training, Yaiko wipes the sweat from his brow with the back of his hand, then runs at Danzo. Barely looking at him, Danzo merely throws a shuriken to down the boy, but dodging out of the way with speed gain through need to keep up with the white fang, Yaiko evades the hit and drives his fist into Danzo's gut. This alone is not enough to dissipate the clone, but then a sudden explosive of force rockets into Danzo's stomach, as Yaiko channels Chakra through the sweat he wiped away to create the impact of a second, stronger punch directly after the first. This is his secret technique, the Undex Fist. The strength of this hit makes the second Danzo evaporate with a sudden poof, and with him gone, Conan is able to assist Nono by raining down paper shurikens onto her Danzo clone, destroying him in an instant. A moment later, Jiraiya returns to them as well, with the five heroes all looking around to see if they can find a trace of where the real Danzo fled while they were fighting his doppelgangers. Unfortunately, they are not left to look long, as with a faint whoosh, Danzo body flickers into the midst of them, and before Jiraiya or the others can act, he lays a kunai to Nagato his throat, ordering them to stand down or the boy dies. 
Back with Sonata and Orochimaru, they are still fighting off the Baku. After all the venom that has been injected into its bloodstream, it has started to become sluggish, but neither Sanian are foolish enough to discount it as a threat, as even wounded, it still has its sweeping trunk, piercing tusks, and stomping feet. This is made most clear when with a fearsome bellow it charges Orochimaru, forcing Tsunade to leap between the beast and her friend, and use the full might of her chakra enhanced strength to push back against its trunk and force it to a stop. Even still it remains a tug of war, with the Baku gaining a few inches every couple of seconds, and Tsunade knows that sooner or later her strength will give out, and unless she is very careful, she will be trampled underfoot. Urgently, Orochimaru prepares to launch a counterattack, but is stopped when the Baku lets out a pain trumpet, then keels over, dead. A moment later, a large gash appears in the beast's stomach, and from it emerges Sakamu, dripping with viscera, but undeniably alive, as he laughs that it looks like he missed one hell of a party, but he guesses the legendary Sunny managed to live up to their name after all. Sardonically, Orochimaru asks Sanade if she thinks Jirao would mind him testing the effect of snake venom on Sakamu, clearly attempting to keep her focus away from the sudden outpouring of blood that would trigger a hemophobia, but alas, no good deed goes unpunished, and so when Tsunade freezes up, the snake sage informs the white fang that he will be taking Tsunade and leaving, since the other man's overly theatrical appearance has rendered her useless to them now, and if he were to leave her, she might be killed. Nodding his understanding, Sakamo gives a quick apology to the slug princess, then without another word, leaps up to the catwalk Jiraiya and his kids ran along earlier. Meanwhile, Team Jiraiya stare down Danzo, hate in each of their faces, though none make a move as the root leader slowly retreats, pulling Nagato with him. Smug satisfaction in his voice, Danzo taunts that Jiraiya never would have made it in his organization, since his attachment to this boy has made him weak. Perhaps in the next life he can return as someone with backbone. After all, his current one will be ending rather soon. Once he shows the Hokage what Jiraiya and his traitorous allies have done, killing fellow Leaf Shinobi and making an attempt on the life of a senior village official, Saratobi will have no choice but to execute the lot of them. Though he is not without mercy, Jiraiya's precious Nagato will be allowed to live, albeit without his eyes, but all the same, by standing down the Toad Sage can save one of his students tonight. Seething, Jiraiya urges Danzo to at least let the kids go free, saying he will gladly give his life and honor if that's what the Shadow Hokage wants, but there's no reason they should have to die. However, Danzo is unmoved, warning that if any of them move so much as a muscle, he will slit Nagato's throat and take the Rinnegan off his corpse. They were all complicit in this assassination attempt, so they all must pay. At these heartless words, anger bubbles up in Nagato, and with a growl he grabs hold of Danzo's wrist. Initially the root leader thinks he's trying to pry the kunai away, but as waves of fatigue overcome him, he realizes too late that he is having his chakra absorbed. In a matter of moments, Danzo's hand gives out and he drops the blade, with his legs doing likewise a moment later causing him to crash to the ground. Nonetheless, Nagato does not loosen his grip even as Danzo's face begins to go pale. Worriedly, Jiraiya tells Nagato to stop, saying if he keeps draining Danzo's chakra he'll die. But with hardened resolve, Nagato says he knows, but he also knows that if they take Danzo alive, he'll find a way to spin this, to keep coming back and hurting the people he loves. For their sake, Nagato has no choice but to end Danzo's life here and now. In a hushed voice, Yaiko asks if his best friend is sure, while with deep sadness, Jiraiya asks what about his ninja way of non-violence, his vow to break Break the cycle of hatred. In a tone of equal sorrow, Nagato admits that maybe the cycle can never be broken after all. When he thinks of what Danzo was about to do to Jiraiya Sensei and the others, a deep hatred for the man wells up inside him, and maybe it's not possible for people to let go of that hate. If everyone feels the same way towards those who have wronged them, perhaps there is no way to stop the cycle from being perpetuated endlessly. However, before any answer can be given, a sharp thunk draws everyone's attention. Looking down, they see Nono's Tanto blade buried in Danzo's throat, the wound having clearly taken his life before Nagato could. Stoically, Nono tells the young redhead that the cycle is broken. He did not enact his vengeance on Danzo in the end, meaning his ninja way has not been breached. Nagato isn't sure what to say to this, but it seems words are unnecessary. As stowing her blade once more, Nono turns to Jiraiya, asking what they should do now. Weighing his options, Jiraiya says the best thing would be for Nono to be turned over to the interrogation corps, since through her memories they can prove the truth of their aspersions to Lord Third, clearing their names of any wrongdoing, now that Danzo can no longer use his influence to do her harm. Nodding, Nono deems this acceptable, and so she and Jiraiya depart, heading to the Hokage's office at last 
asked to put this nightmarish ordeal to bed. When they are alone, Nagato, Conan, and Yahiko do not share any words. There is no need to. Instead, they simply huddle together, wrapping each other in a hug as joy, relief, remorse, and a flurry of other more ill-defined emotions course through them. Following Nona's interrogation by a member of the Yamanaka clan, it is found that all Jiraiya's claims were true, with Hiruzen having to admit that like it or not, Danzo and his shadowy root organization held the true power in Konoha for many years. However, even though he has admitted it to himself, to do so to the public would be an entirely different matter, and so has decided that all who know of Danzo's treachery be sworn to silence. In order to keep up appearances, Danzo is given a formal funeral in which his great deeds are extolled, and he is named a patron and a hero of the leaf. Such duplicity troubles Nagato, almost as much as Danzo's actions, but all the same he stays quiet, not because of the Hokage's orders, but because he knows it is the best thing he can do for the village he and his comrades fought to rid of Danzo's darkness, the village that has become his home. Nagato sees now that in spite of himself, that is what the village has become. A place neither all good nor all bad, but a place where he was able to make friends and find a new family with Yahiko, Konan, and Jiraiya Sensei. His bond with them makes this a precious place, and as he at last ties on the Konoha forehead protector, he truly feels like a part of the Hidden Leaf. And that's where we'll leave this season of What If Jiraiya Brought the Rain Trio to the Hidden Leaf. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, please don't forget to like, subscribe, and leave your thoughts, suggestions, or screams of rage in the comments below.